There's 19, 20, there's another 20, so it's four. Okay, thank you. On two for 21. One for 19. Renumbering. Okay. Yeah, that's fine, Chris. What number are you doing? Say a word to me the whole night. Isn't that nice? I thought that was really nice. Hi. 20. How many do we have? Hi there. What do you need? The item number or? That's okay. It's a little intimidating. Good evening, everyone. We're glad to have you here tonight. I certainly want to welcome everyone to the council meeting tonight uh, on the 17th of December 2018. We're very glad to have you with us today. Uh, I hope that you will please join me in a moment of silent meditation. Thank you. Councilmember Reese, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. If it's your practice to do so, and if you're able, please join us uh, and rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, Thank you very much, Councilmember Reese. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shul. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Councilmember Alston. Here. Councilmember Caballero. Here. Councilmember Freeman. Present. Councilmember Middleton. Here. Councilmember Reese. Here. Thank you very much. We have we have two. We have two uh, ceremonial items tonight, and in a minute, I'm sure I will get this, in, the material for the ceremonial items. I will, we'll, we'll move on and we'll come back to the ceremonial items. If you're here for one of the two ceremonial items, sit tight, we'll get to you in just a minute. All right, uh, we will move on to announcements by the council and then we'll come back to our ceremonial items. Are there any announcements by the council? Council Member Caballero. Um, good evening. I just wanted to say that um, we're all aware in Durham that there has been an increase in armed robberies apparently aimed at the Latino community in Durham and there was uh, several shootings this weekend and we recognize that many in the community are scared and there have... Um, Conversations with our city manager, Tom Bonfield, and our police chief, C.J. Davis, have happened over the weekend, and we will be 
holding events early in 2019 to give an opportunity for the community to uh, share concerns and also open up conversations. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I look forward to participating in those conversations. I know that we all do. So thank you so much. And thank you, Mr. Bonfield and uh, to Chief Davis. We need to pay a lot of attention to this. Uh, and uh, I know that our police department will do so. And uh, so I appreciate it. Uh, announcements. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want to acknowledge that we have joining us tonight uh, several supporters of the resolution that's on our consent agenda to repeal the Hyde Amendment. Um, they do not wish to speak, but I just wanted to acknowledge that they were here tonight. Do you want to stand up? <coughs> thank you for being here. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, and thank you all for being here. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you and some of the other folks up here on the dais may have wondered why you have a very strange looking um, collection of cards held together by a binder. Um, I want to explain what that's about. This past Friday, Councilmember uh, Freeman and I had the privilege of attending something called the Reality Cafe, which I think, Mr. Mayor, you attended earlier this year. Uh, this is a pretty special meal that's served to guests twice a month here in the city of Durham by members of a faith congregation called Reality Ministries. And what makes Reality Cafe, the Reality Cafe special is what makes Reality Ministry special, and this is quoting from their website, the ministry, the mission of Reality Ministries is to create opportunities for teens and adults with and without developmental disabilities <coughs> to experience belonging, kinship, uh, and the reality of Christ's love. The Reality Cafe team is made up of Reality Ministries congregants both with and without developmental disabilities. It, I have to say it was one of the kindest, warmest rooms I've been in in quite some time, and I think Councilmember Freeman can back me up there. Um, and uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I, as I said, you, you attended earlier this year. The food was phenomenal. Which brings me to the um, recipe books in front of you. Uh, these are my holiday gifts to you, Mr. Mayor, to each of my colleagues on the city council, to the city manager, the city attorney, and city clerk. This is a book entitled World's Greatest Big Time Pretty Reality Cafe Recipe Book 2017-2018. This is a book of recipes from dishes served at the Reality Cafe over the last couple of years, including in many cases the photographs of the folks who prepared <coughs> each dish. Uh, proceeds from the sale of these recipe books, um, which came from my own personal funds, not city funds, by the way, uh, support the life-affirming and faith-affirming mission of Reality Ministries. And if folks want to learn more about that, they can search for them on the internet. Uh, so happy holidays to everyone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Charlie. <clears throat> Other announcements, Council Member Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good evening to everyone. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I want to associate myself with the comments of my colleague, <coughs> Council Javier, uh, Councilor Caballero, with respect uh, to the amount of gunfire in our city on um, this weekend. For many of our residents and citizens, this is a season of light and hope and peace and expectancy. And I know for many of us that was that was rocked uh, this weekend by the amount of gunfire. And, and I want to also associate my comments with the uh, commendations of our, of our police department. And I know with the election of new leadership, uh, there's a great deal of expectancy uh, with respect to, to law enforcement and our judiciary. And I, and I applaud those, those elections and, and I share the anticipation. But I also want to give voice to uh, folk in the city tonight who see it beyond uh, just a law enforcement issue. I think this underscores um, our need for our shared economic prosperity plan, which is forthcoming, um, because we understand that there are causes. Uh, we stand in solidarity with every community, every community in this city who wants to feel safe and at peace, our Latino brothers and sisters, our Asian community, as well as uh, the whites, African Americans, all of us uh, in the Bull City. So I want to associate myself with, with uh, Councillor Caballero's uh, comments. I also want to say uh, that in addition to the great work that I know our I team is doing with respect to gunfire, we know we operate in a legislative context where we don't have many options. Uh, I intend also to, to continue to push and, and to give voice to us to exploit every, every tool that we can uh, on dealing with this problem. And let me be clear. Crime in Durham overall is down. We know that we're prospering. We know that there's a great, this is a great city. But the problem of accessibility to guns and gunfire is an American problem, and it, and it plagues uh, many, if not all, great American cities. So I, I want to be very clear. Uh, overall, things are going well in Durham, but we know that this is a problem. It's a problem that's unique to America. And, and I intend on, on continuing, as I was saying, to push uh, for us to exploit every uh, tool that we can, from technological to economic uh, to law enforcement as well. Um, my prayers and heart, my heart and prayers go out 
uh, to folk that have been affected this weekend. But beyond that, after we say amen, after praying, I'm hoping that there will be some, some sustained uh, and meaningful action uh, taken by this government, not only at the national and state level, but locally as well. And I know we will because I know the hearts of the folk that sit on this dais. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Any other, um, any other announcements tonight? Uh, I have one other announcement, which is I want to appreciate our city clerk and the clerk's office for the wonderful uh, reception that we just had for all of our board volunteers. The, the city council appoints 160 members to various boards and commissions. It's everything from the DPAC oversight board to the airport authority to the housing authority to the environmental affairs board, appearance commission. We have many, racial equity commission. We have many of them. And tonight we had most of those people were here with us for a wonderful reception to honor them. And <clears throat> this is the first time we've done that. And I want to thank the clerk and the clerk's office for just a wonderful event. So thank you all for putting that together for all of us. And I also want to especially thank those members on those boards and commissions who serve. Uh, it is a volunteer task. And I see Council Member Eugene Brown here in the front row nodding in agreement with me. Uh, the, the folks that serve on these boards and commissions uh, do, work very hard on behalf of all of us, and I just want to express my gratitude. I do want to welcome you, Councilmember Brown, back to the to the chambers. Uh, I don't think we've seen you in a while, and so it's good to have you back. Um, all right. Uh, any other announcements by the council? I'm now going to move to our. Are we ready for the uh, ceremonial items? Great. Okay, thank you. Now we'll move to the ceremonial items. I'm going to take this out. Is that okay? Now you have to be smarter than me to do it. Okay, there you go. Uh, we're going to begin with the uh, Neighbor Spotlight Award, and I'm going to ask Mary Ann Cobbs if she would come forward, and any members of her family or community that she would like to come with her. Please come, everybody. Come on up and join us here see you. Come on up and, and, and join us right here up on the podium. You've got a good support team. Ms. Cobbs, I am going to, uh, well, I'll wait just a minute. I'm so glad everybody's here. Come on up. Ms. Velma, come on up here. Your hand. Good job. Come on up. <coughs> okay. I'm going to move this just a little bit. Miss Cobbs, this is great. So, this is the Neighbor Spotlight Award, and I will be reading a little bit about Miss Cobbs, and then Miss Cobbs, I'm going to turn this microphone over to you for a minute or two to make any remarks that you would like to make. How does that sound? Sure. Great. Mary Ann Cobbs is the recipient of the Neighbor Spotlight Award for the month of December 2018. The Neighbor Spotlight Award recognizes community members that have gone above and beyond in volunteering their time to serve this community. This month, Mary Ann Cobbs, a resident of the Merrick Moore community, was nominated and selected because of the wonderful work she has done in her neighborhood including, but not limited to, supporting the younger generation rebuilding the Merrick Moore Community Club, hosting annual National Night Out events, advocating with neighbors to address concerns such as repairs for neighborhood streets, volunteering at activities to support the less fortunate, including the food pantry at the Holton Resource Center. Ms. Cobbs, I want to congratulate you on being the December Neighbor Spotlight for the City of Durham, and I want to thank you for all the work that you do to improve our Durham community. Congratulations. I'm going to hand you this Neighbor Spotlight Award, and I'm going to give you the microphone and, uh, and, and, and tell us a few things. First of all, I would like to thank uh, all my friends, neighbors, that came out to support me tonight for this award. I want to let you know that I will be advocating 
and lobbying for the Merrick Moore community and for my friends and, and including the food pantry at Holton. So I am glad to receive this award and thank you for coming to support me and nominating me for this award. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for selecting me. And I really appreciate everything that you are doing for the city of Durham. Thank, thank you. I'm not sure who that came to that, but you, you're lucky to have it. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you for being here, everybody. Oh, good. Jacob's taking our picture. Come on. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for being here. Really appreciate y'all being here tonight. Thank you. Y'all are welcome to stay, but if you leave, we won't hurt our feelings. <laughs> you can watch it live at home. Good to see you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. That's your mom? No, we got to watch it. She's clearly amazing. Yes, she's crazy. All right. I love the neighborhood spotlight, and uh, this is the wonderful award for Miss Cobbs. And now we're going to move on to the, uh, our next uh, <coughs> ceremonial item. This is not a, a proclamation or award. This is a, uh, we will be hearing about the 115th anniversary of the Bassett Affair. And I'm going to call up Valerie Gillespie, a Duke University archivist. And I'm also going to call up uh, Mr. Eddie Davis, our public historian and I look forward to uh, what they have to say to us. So come on up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's my understanding from reading the press accounts um, that you all had a very long meeting last time, <laughs> and that was a early, um, well, late night meeting in the early part of December. <clears throat> and as the mayor has mentioned, um, 115 years ago, there was another late night meeting in early December uh, that took place with another policy making body here in Durham. And tonight we are honored to have two people who might be able to share just a little bit about uh, uh, the Bassett Affair. Uh, the first person is um, uh, the university archivist at Duke University, Ms. Valerie Gillespie. And following her brief presentation, we're going to invite, if we can, um, former city council member Eugene Brown up because he actually lives uh, in the abode that was built by uh, Thomas Bassett. So, I'm sorry, John Spencer Bassett. <laughs> so, so, let me turn the microphone over to um, Ms. Gillespie. Thank you so much, Mr. Davis and Mayor Shule and the City Council for inviting me here to say a few words about this important historical event that happened at the turn of the century in Durham. Known as the Bassett Affair, this event was seen as a beacon for academic freedom, thrusting both the city and the college into the national spotlight. As some of you may know, Trinity College, later to become Duke University, arrived in Durham in 1892. College leaders hoped that moving to the young and growing tobacco city would help stabilize the institution financially and grow it into a more prominent college. It moved from the very rural Randolph County to the west of here, and it opened in Durham with fewer than 200 students and just 13 faculty members. One of these faculty members was professor of history, John Spencer Bassett. An alumnus of Trinity College and a native of Tarboro, Bassett had earned his PhD at Johns Hopkins. He was passionate about using primary sources like diaries, letters, and newspapers to investigate history. He believed the writing of history should go beyond veneration and anecdotes and instead be handled professionally with a scientific gathering of facts, relying on these primary sources to make an informed argument. This was in contrast to many other historians working at the time, who viewed the past in romantic and non-factual terms at many times, and particularly when dealing with issues of race. In 1902, Bassett began publishing the South Atlantic Quarterly, 
a journal devoted to the kind of rigorous and scientific scholarship he promoted. He described it as a journal devoted to the literary, historical, and social development of the South. As the editor, he took the liberty of writing articles himself on, controver on controversial topics, including race. And although he knew it would likely stir up trouble, he nevertheless wrote an article called Stirring Up the Fires of Race Antipathy. This was published in 1903. His subject were, was recent incidents in which white people had refused to eat in the same dining room as black educator Booker T. Washington. Washington had incidentally visited Durham and Trinity seven years earlier. Bassett objected to such treatment of the distinguished public figure. He wrote that Washington was, quote, the greatest man, save General Lee, born in the South in 100 years. Such a statement did not go over well with some white North Carolinians, particularly Democrats, who were actively supporting platforms of white supremacy at that time. The Democratic press, including the Raleigh News and Observer and its editor, Josephus Daniels, were outraged by the favorable comparison of a black man to the Confederate general. Not so subtly, uh, these media outlets referred to Bassett by printing his name, as you can see on the right, in an unflattering way. They suggested that no one should send their children to Trinity and that Bassett should resign immediately. Back in Durham, Bassett had the support of President Kilgo and his fellow faculty members, as well as the students, but the public pressure was mounting. The case came to a head the night of December 2nd, 1903, when the Trinity Board of Trustees gathered to uh, review a letter of resignation that Bassett had submitted to them. After many hours of debate at 3 a.m. early in the morning of December 3rd, the board voted not to accept Bassett's resignation by a vote of 18 to 7. Students were gathered outside the building where the vote was taken and they excitedly built a bonfire and rang a college bell. The entire president and the entire faculty, the president and all of the students had been prepared to resign if the board had allowed the resignation to proceed. But Trinity had upheld the freedom of scholars to investigate and conclude what they believed. While some of the press continued to grumble, the case gained national attention, as you can see with some of these headlines, and Trinity was wide, widely admired for its stand on academic freedom. Two years later, President Teddy Roosevelt came to North Carolina on a tour. An admirer of this stand for academic freedom, he invited Bassett to join him in Raleigh and to ride with him on his private train into Durham. The train stopped on Main Street by Trinity College's gates uh, near to the entrance of today's East Campus. The city was ecstatic to see the president arrive. One onlooker remarked, quote, the whole town was decorated with flags and buntings by the yards and every factory school and place of business suspended. Roosevelt told students to repay their alma mater by making it, quote, evident to the to the generation that is rising, that you are fit for leadership, that the training has not been wasted, that you are ready to render to the state the kind of service which is invaluable, because it cannot be bought, because there is no price which can be put upon it. The values of academic freedom and free inquiry have indeed been carried forward in our community in Durham and beyond, and we are proud to call Durham the home of the Bassett Affair. Thank you. So, Mr. Mayor and Council, if you will indulge Mr. Brown just a few moments and ask, we ask that he can tell us a little bit about living uh, at 410 um, Buchanan Boulevard. Thanks, Eddie. Uh, North Buchanan, by the way, because <laughs> there's a South Buchanan as well, and it, we sometimes get mail from for them. Uh, we bought the home in 1980. And I'm glad we bought it then because we could not afford it today, believe me. Uh, we've, my wife, Signa, and I have enjoyed uh, living in Trinity Park. At the time, it was considered somewhat of a, a student slum neighborhood, and that has changed over the years. In keeping with the spirit of John Spencer Bassett, we have remained active in the political scene, and as a result, we've had quite a few notable politicians at our home for parties and fundraisers. A few I should mention would be Kitty Dukakis, Gary Hart, 
Harvey Grant, Whip Gully, occasionally even Steve came over, <laughs> and of course my former boss, Joe Biden. So it has remained a political active hub, and we have tried to maintain the spirit of Professor Bassett. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eugene. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Eddie, for a great presentation. And um, I think that we all need to maintain the spirit of Professor Bassett. And uh, it's, a, it's a great history lesson for us. I want to just remind everyone who's here tonight and who might be watching that uh, we are grateful uh, to Eddie Davis, who is our public historian, who is bringing us these history moments periodically Dura, uh, as we approach Durham's sesquicentennial year, our 150th anniversary. And we are going to be remembering Durham's history, both the challenging moments such as this and uh, the, the lighter and more joyful moments as well uh, during this next period of time. So I just want to, um, just want to remind everyone of that and, and, uh, and look forward to that. So thank you all so much. All right, I, I'm going to just take a moment to just uh, make a personal comment out of, out, of the, out of order of the announcements. I would have made it during the announcements, but I didn't think about it till now, uh, colleagues. I, um, I see, I was thinking as I was looking out into the audience tonight, sometimes about the very deep personal connections that we all have and value so much. And I was seeing two of my friends here, Tommy Clayton and John Burness, uh, sitting together. John's younger brother, Andy, was my college roommate and very, very close friend many years ago. Tommy's sister, Eleanor Ann, uh, was, is the, for many years, uh, in the retirement community my parents lived in, was in Lynchburg, Virginia, was their next door neighbor. On Monday nights, uh, Eleanor Ann and Joe and, and their other neighbors uh, get my father, who's 94 years old, and they take him uh, to dinner uh, and, uh, and gather around him and support him uh, in, uh, his, in his old age and uh, have been just absolutely wonderful to him. So I just wanted to say um, we all depend on those really deep uh, networks and relationships, and I just wanted to thank you guys and your, and your siblings for their part in my life and my, my family's life. All right. Um, I'm going to now move on to uh, the priority items by the city manager. Mr. Manager, any priority? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. No priority items. All righty. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Attorney? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. Madam Clerk? Good evening, Mayor. No items. Thank you so much. Um, we're now going to move to the consent agenda. The consent agenda can be approved by a single vote of the council. Um, if Items can be removed by the, from the consent agenda by any member of the public or by a member of the council. Um, and if an item is removed, it is then heard at the end of the meeting. Um, and I will now read the consent agenda items. Item one, approval of city council minutes. Item two, mayor's nominee for reappointment, Raleigh-Durham Airport Authority. <coughs> Item three, mayor's nominee for appointment, Durham Housing Authority Board of Commissioners. Item four, resolution calling for repeal of the Hyde Amendment and supporting the right of all people to safe and comprehensive health care. Item five, grant contract with Legal Aid of North Carolina to provide legal representation to city of Durham residents facing eviction. Item six, subrecipient contract award of community development block grant CDBG funds to CASA, formerly known as Community Alternatives for Supportive Abodes for Rental Housing Rehabilitation Maplewood Underwood Apartments. Mr. Mayor, can I pull that item? Okay, we're going to pull item six. Okay. Item seven, grant contract with Urban Ministries of Durham, UMD, to provide case management services. Item eight, amendment number one to the unscheduled pipeline repair contract with Carolina Civil Works, Inc. Item nine, phase three, roof replacements at various Department of Water Management facilities. Amendment two to engineering services contract with Raymond Engineering, Georgia, Inc. 
Item 10, property donation agreement with the Research Triangle Regional Public Transportation Authority, Go Triangle for the Durham Arch Light Rail Transit Project. Item 12, janitorial services contract for the Durham Armory, January 2019 to December 2021. Item 13, NC Department of Public Safety Division of Emergency Management 2018 Hurricane Florence Mutual Aid Grant Project Ordinance. Item 14, revisions to the City Code of Ordinances pertaining to small wireless facilities in response to Federal Communications Commission Order FCC 18-133. <coughs> Item 15, utility extension agreement with Joe F. Marini Construction Company, Inc. to serve Rocky Ridge Phase 4. You have heard the consent agenda, and with the exception of Item 6, I'll accept, an I'll accept a motion that we approve the consent agenda. Move, Move to approve. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we uh, approve the consent agenda. Agenda, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. Uh, could I uh, ask, I know it's probably, it's not uh, in accordance with all your procedures, but if there is just that one item that uh, yeah. uh, there's a question that we could possibly Absolutely. answer quickly. I know we've got yes. extensive public hearing items tonight. The staff won't have to stay till late. Happy to, to do hopefully so. hopefully answer a quick question. Yeah, thank you very much. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. We will now move to item six, and uh, I'll ask <coughs> Council Member Freeman um, for questions. I had a specific question. Um, is someone from CASA here? Uh, no, Madam uh, Council Member, no one, we don't have anybody from CASA that's here tonight. I have a grave concern. It was brought to my attention, apparently, that CASA does not accept Section 8 vouchers. I have not heard that. I would have to confirm that. I have not heard that. Is it possible to delay this item until that is that can be confirmed or denied? Like, I, I really feel some kind of way about them discriminating on the basis of source of income uh, and yes, receiving funds from the city. Uh, what I'm going to ask, Reginald, is that you check that out now. We'll hold this item until you're able to check that. If you could be in contact with some CASA people, that would be great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, we'll now move to um, item to our, to our uh, general business agenda, the public hearing items. The first item was uh, item 19, zoning map change for West Point at 751, revision 4. Good evening. Good evening, Ms. Sonyak. Hmm. Before I get started, I just want to um, make note that all of the planning and zoning matters before you tonight have been properly noticed in accordance with state and local requirements, and affidavits of such are available in the planning department. Uh, West Point at 751, revisions number four. Good evening, I am Jamie Sunyak with the Planning Department. The City Council approved a zoning map change and development plan for West Point at 751 Revisions 4 on April 4th, 2016. That was a legacy case Z150027. The approval changed the zoning from the property to Commercial Center with a development plan, CCD, and stipulated a maximum of 120,000 square feet of office medical, office hospital use, 18,000 18, uh, square feet of retail, 16,000 square feet of restaurant use, and a hotel of 217 rooms. The applicant, Robert Schunk from Stewart, is requesting some minor revisions to the text commitments. The first is to add medical office and hospital as an additional use to PID 21314 Six, that's the building envelope B. And the second is to stipulate no south facing building signage except on buildings in envelope B and D. No other changes are proposed to the rest of the approved development plan. <coughs> per the Unified Development Ordinance, any revisions to text commitments are considered a significant change and require a new hearing and recommendation from the Planning Commission prior to the case being heard by the City Council. The Planning Commission at their October 9th, 2018 meeting recommended approval of the proposed by a vote of nine to zero. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Two motions are required for this application. The first is required 
uh, to adopt a consistency statement. And the second is for the zoning ordinance. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Ms. Sunyak. You've heard the report from staff, and I'm going to declare this public hearing open. Um, and I'm going to first ask if there are any questions for staff by members of the council. If not, I see we have one speaker on this item, uh, Robert Schonk. Are there any other people that w are here tonight that would like to speak on this item? Mr. Schonk, you have three minutes. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council. I um, just wanted to st thank staff for their uh, work on this project, um, and uh, I'm, only, I'm here for any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Colleagues, uh, any questions or uh, concerns? Anything for staff? Or Mr. Shunk, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, any, anyone else that would like to speak on this item? Is there anyone else that would like to speak on this item? If not, I'm going to de declare this public hearing closed and the matter, matter is back before the council and I'll accept a motion on a consistency statement. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. We adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you so much. Uh, we now need a motion to adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. We'll now move to item 20, zoning map change for Pinecrest. Uh, and I'll ask for the report from staff. Good evening, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. A request for a zoning map change has been received from Pinecrest Duke LLC for six parcels totaling approximately 9.11 acres, generally located at 1050 West Forest Hills Boulevard. The subject track is currently located in the Rural Suburban 20 zone. The applicant is requesting a zoning designation of planned residential development 6.000. <clears throat> the area is uh, designated as medium density residential. So that's a 6 to 12 dwelling unit per acre on the future land use map, which is consistent with the rezoning request. <coughs> Key commitments on the development plan associated with this request include setting a maximum of 46 dwelling units, designating single family detached and town townhouse um, as the permitted building types, providing a 20-foot uh, boundary buffer along Westwood Drive and West Forest Hills Boulevard, dedicating a 50-foot wide greenway easement with a 5-foot wide natural trail, and stipulating uh, no commercial uses. Um, there are several other uh, text commitments um, within the staff report. The um, Durham Planning Commission at their October 9, 2018 meeting recommended approval of the proposed by a vote of nine to zero. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Two motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt a consistency statement and the second is for the zoning ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sunyak. You've heard the report from staff and I'm now to declare this public hearing open and I'm gonna first ask that there are any questions for staff by members of the council. Just one. Sure. Nine zero. There were missing votes. Is there a? There were several members absent. Okay. That's correct, right? Nine yes. to zero. Nine zero is correct. Yeah. All right. Uh, we'll now. Uh, we have a number of speakers on this item. Uh, let me just make a quick count here. Now, we have on the order of 15 speakers or so on this item. Um, I'm going to uh, ask 
First of all, are there any speakers in opposition to this item? Is there anyone here speaking in opposition to this item? Anyone speaking in opposition on item 20? Okay. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, is there someone who is organizing the speakers uh, for the uh, proponents of this rezoning? Mr. Spaulding? Mr. Spaulding, uh, why don't you come to the podium and let's talk about how much time you and your uh, the speakers need. Could we talk about that a little bit? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, my name is Ken Spaulding. I represent the applicant. Uh, the 15 speakers, may I just ask them a question? Yes, sir. Uh, which ones of you uh, would very much like to speak uh, and those that want to waive your time? Raise your hand for those that absolutely want to speak. Okay. We, we want more than one. Uh, okay. Uh, then we, we would say no more than five at right. time. Right. That's good. And then, I think what I'll do is this, Mr. Spaulding. I will give you all 15 minutes. Okay. Let's see how it goes. If there's more time necessary, we can do that as well. Okay. All right? Thank you. Uh, and uh, so, so go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. As I said, my name is Ken Spaulding, and I represent the applicant in this matter involving Pinecrest, which is the estate of Dr. Mary Siemens of the Duke family. Uh, I want to thank personally uh, Bob Chapman, for bringing me in to help on this because my mother and Dr. Siemens were extremely close. Uh, back during the times of the riots in Durham, when Durham was about to burn and was on fire, uh, my mother had started the Women in Action for the Prevention of Violence and its Causes. One of the first people that came forward to work with her was Dr. Siemens. And the important thing about it was that men ran Durham at that time, both in the public sector and the private sector. And in a way, in order to try to appeal to Durham leaders to find a way to bring an end to the violence, bring an end to the riots, and bring an end to the fire, they wanted the women pulled together to try to prevail upon the men to see that we need to do more in Durham to work together. My mother and Ms. Siemens continued to work throughout those years to make Durham a better place. Dr. Siemens was not only a philanthropist, but in a sense a civil rights activist who came from the Duke family and who contributed to our community in a most meaningful manner. I also want to thank uh, James Siemens for bringing us Phil Clark, who is a custom builder. They did a national search to get someone to make sure that this was a development that was one that would follow the legacy and the heritage of this family. I announced tonight that, unfortunately, James, who had worked with Phil Clark, gone down to Atlanta to make sure that those homes were the types of homes to be built here. Uh, he passed this morning. Mm -hmm. As Dr. Seaman was a woman of compassion, and passion. So was James, just like his mother. One of the last things he said to me about your planning commission was that, Mr. Spaulding, I appreciate not only the work you've done, but I appreciate the kind remarks that the planning commission members made about his mother. Because he wanted to make sure that his mother's wishes would be carried out to where they would be friendly neighbors not opposed in opposition, but neighbors that were able to find a way to have whatever would be done with her estate would be welcomed by her community. The family wanted this use of Dr. Seaman's estate to be developed as a special place in a special neighborhood. We are creating a place respecting the life, heritage, legacy, and tradition of the Duke and Seaman's family. 
We also wanted to respect the wish of the city of Durham through its comprehensive plan and through you all's guidelines and requirements. But we also wanted to respect the neighbors who were not here tonight, but who opposed this project in the beginning, but who are not here tonight because of the fact that we have worked together, as Dr. Siemens would like for us to do, as James would like for us to do, to be able to come with a solution and a project and a development that all of Durham would be proud of. We have given our most earnest and sincere efforts to re reach these goals. We have weighed and juggled to make sure that we met the requ requisite density while at the same time recognizing that we wanted to have a development that was compatible with the neighbors and homes there. We feel that we have created or will be creating a future place which will be unique to Durham, the Triangle, and the state of North Carolina. Our goals were to be able to respect buffers, the ecology and environment. We wanted to make it aesthetically pleasing to match and go with the existing homes. We wanted to have a strategic array of homes in a strategic location. We wanted to be respectful of the use of this estate of its natural beauty and to preserve history that existed on those premises. Staff has assessed our adherence to our city's policies and rules and plans and procedures. The neighbors have come together to support this project. The Planning Commission voted nine to zero with wonderful remarks that you will see in your staff report in support of this development. So we respectfully you as well, that we want this not to be just a development, but we want it to be a testament to the life, history, dignity of Dr. Siemens and her family. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Spaulding. Uh, Mr. Chapman? Let me just say, when, as Mr. Chapman's coming up, uh, I will hear from him. And if there's anyone else that would like to speak at this point, feel free. I'm, you know, every, everyone who would like to be heard will be heard. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, my name is Robert L. Chapman, uh, 2525 Lanier Place. Um, I spent the afternoon uh, at the Siemens House, uh, <laughs> corner of Boundary and Rosemary in Chapel Hill, with Margaret and several friends. Um, James was one of the kindest, most considerate, most thoughtful people I've ever met. Um, he, would have, he would have had to be uh, being uh, the son of um, Mary Siemens and Dr. James Siemens. He also probably had to be because his name was James Duke Biddle Trent Siemens, mm -hmm. which was quite a... But I've known, I knew... James and New Margaret for over 30 years and had a good time um, working with them over the last five years on what should happen with Pinecrest. It was really too much for one family. Um, and looking at all the alternatives, traveling to Atlanta, meeting Phil, and then watching and learning uh, as Phil brought the neighborhood together, which I was so impressed with, and James was so happy about. James, I don't think I ever saw him happier um, recently, uh, other than his birthday party, which was last year, um, than after the planning commission meeting. Um, and Margaret just wanted to say, uh, carry on and uh, let's move forward with the plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak at this time? All right. Um, yes, go ahead. Please identify yourself. And uh, April Johnson, Executive Director of Preservation Durham. Mm -hmm. Andrew Henson, Board President of Preservation Durham. Okay, go ahead. You have three minutes. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to say we're grateful and pleased that the developer, Phil Clark, and his associates worked so diligently with the Forest Hill neighborhood residents to come up with a 
agreeable plan for this property. Um, we we um, support that they protect the historic building and that they um, include development that fits well with the neighborhood. We urge that you vote to approve this change. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard at this time? Mr. Burness. In deference to the time, I will, um, and to Mayor Shule, I will refrain from regaling members of the council with stories my brother has told me mm -hmm. about what it was like to be a roommate with our distinguished mayor well mm -hmm. before his hair turned gray. Um, my name is John Burness. I live at 1506 Kent Street. I have lived there since I think around 2000. Um, and it's directly across the street from the property in question, the Pinecrest property. I believe we have more frontage um, in relationship to the property than anybody else in our neighborhood. Um, and I watched with interest as a group of our neighbors raised, in some ways, understandable concerns about the project and was pleased to see the developer and the neighbors come together to agree that the project should go forward after considerable negotiations, which of course led to the unanimous vote of the planning board. Um, uh, the main thing I would like to say is I, I think Mary Siemens would be proud that this is what has ended up you know, about to happen to her uh, property after all these years. Uh, she loved Durham. I, I believe at one time she was a member of this council. Yes, she was. Um, and she, she, she just loved Durham with such a passion and would not want her place to be a place of real contention. And I think we've ended up in a place where it is not. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're ready for those stories, John. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they'll be forever secrets. <laughs> he just kept stepping. I never should have said that. All right. Is there anyone else who would like to be heard at this time? Yes. Please come up and identify yourself. Hello. My name is Josh McCarty. I live at 1613 Bivens Street, which is about a block away from the property. And I just wanted to say briefly that I was enthusiastically in favor of Pinecrest and uh, really excited about the opportunity it would bring. And um, I was sorry to hear about... Uh, Mr. Siemens, that's, that's really sad. Um, and I uh, just wanted to express my support for uh, density and uh, uh, creating walkable urban environments in our city. And I think it's going to be really important for us as a community to be able to pay for our services and infrastructure as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCarty. Are there any other, anyone else like to make a comment at this time? Thank you. Please give us your name and address. You also have three minutes. Yes, real fast. Uh, Ray Williams, 1709 Wallace Street. Just wanted to say, <clears throat> Phil has also done a great job reaching out to other neighborhoods adjacent to Pinecrest. Uh, former president of Long Meadow, uh, he was very concerned that Long Meadow was also uh, on board. And um, I'm an architect. I work with a lot of developers. I appreciate. Uh, Phil's well intention here. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else that would like to speak at this time? Is there anyone else that would like to be heard? Mr. Stanziel? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council, George Stanziel, president of Stewart. I live at 115 Cofield Circle. I just wanted to actually just finish up with some a few facts here. Um, <clears throat> Uh, as a follow-up to Mr. Spaulding's uh, very on-point comments, and in addition to the 19 meetings that we've had with neighbors over the course of the last year and a half, we've worked very closely, in particular with the Durham Neighbors Together uh, group, and have reached a lengthy agreement with them on a number of items uh, that relate to such things as density and residential housing types, boundary buffers, a path uh, along the existing stream, an entrance relocation, uh, recorded architectural guidelines, as well as our intention, uh, and this is important, as our intention to seek a by right 20% reduction in density at site plan approval. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, this will allow us to stay within the comprehensive plan 
of six to 12 units an acre, um, but will only, um, that will allow us to build only uh, 38 units within the zoning uh, boundary. Um, so there's a, by ordinance, uh, with an approved development plan, we can request a 20% reduction in density, and we've agreed uh, to do that. <laughs> Our effective density at this point is 4.17 units per acre uh, and is very consistent with the surrounding densities in both Forest Hills and Longmeadow. And just to point out that this isn't just about Forest Hills. Longmeadow is right across the street and we've engaged with those um, members as well. Uh, while we completely understand that DNT does not resent, represent all of Forest Hills, we have listened to all the neighbors and incorporated many of the conditions and requests we've heard from them uh, on a consistent basis. Uh, they've been included in our uh, development plan uh, commitments. <laughs> We're hopeful that you will see that we have truly made an outstanding effort uh, to understand and be empathetic toward our neighbors and concerns and uh, feedback. We've been inclusive, we've listened, We've been communicative through 19 meetings, multiple and consistent emails, letters, and listserv throughout the process of the past year and a half. We've made significant changes to our plan resulting in a lower density by 30%, uh, a, a reduction in housing, uh, which uh, was the original basis for the creation of this unique place and physical changes to our plan, some of which had, have had some relatively significant impacts. We hope you feel that you will, as we do, that this will be a high quality, unique community uh, in Durham and most likely in the Triangle. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stanzial. Is there anyone else that would like to comment on this item? Anyone else that would like to comment on this item? All right, uh, I'm now going to ask if there are any questions uh, or comments by members of the, questions for staff by members of the council or questions for the applicant. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a question for the applicant. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, could you describe how your project, like what aspects of your project changed as a result of conversations with the neighborhood? Uh, Density, for one thing, it uh, went down from around 50, 58, down to uh, in the 40, lower 50s or uh, 40s, and then uh, we were able to get it to work out where it got down to 38. Uh, there was, um, they wanted a, a path, a connection path. We were able to, to deal with that. Uh, we were able to uh, um, show, give them a sense of the quality of the uh, architectural aspects of it, which which you'll see in your report, uh, it's uh, and the also assure them on the traffic by not doing a TIA but doing a uh, on-site traffic uh, study during a period of time to let them know about that uh, to allay as many of their fears and concern about uh, the changing of their neighborhood. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Other questions for the applicant or for uh, the uh, the staff? Uh, Council Member Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the applicant. Would you mind telling us what the price points are for the units? Good to see you. Yes, sir. What was that again? The price points uh, for the units? Price points, uh, they're from 800 and something, seven or so on up to 950,000, in the general area of what you have. There, this will provide an opportunity even for people who live in Forest Hills with the very, 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 very large houses that they have. Uh, it will give them an opportunity, as some as have expressed, to sort of move over and still be in the Forest Hills neighborhood, but to be able to retire and, and uh, continue to have their homes there. Uh, that's why I said in my statement about the diversity uh, of homes, if you really look at it, um, Downtown, you have a lot of density and a lot of condos and apartments and, and all that type, but you don't actually have as close to the middle of town as you do with Forest Hills to be able to also have a diverse type of home, which is attached and detached in a very well-planned neighborhood sense, uh, not just in a condo sense and not just in an apartment sense. Uh, and so, 
you're able to have in the downtown urban tier, you're able to have uh, this type of combination of homes and, and uh, at those prices. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, I have a question for the applicant. Mr. Spaulding, um, have you all considered uh, a contribution to the uh, city's affordable housing fund uh, from the developer, uh, as well as uh, there are nine students being added to Durham Public Schools? And have you all considered a contribution to the, uh, to the Durham Public Schools uh, on behalf of these uh, students? Uh, yes, we, we've considered that, and uh, at this time, based on all that's been done with this project and scaling back, we would uh, have to indicate uh, de declining that at this time. Okay. Thank you. Questions? I have one. Council Member Alston. And I think I know the answer to this, but only because you've mentioned downsizing for folks. These are not like age restricted. No, they're, they're no, just, they're, okay. no, no, I didn't no, think so. Not. I just wanted to confirm that. No, but. Older people are going to be interested. Sure. Yeah. Well, let's, talk, let's say seasoned people. Okay. Are the, are the questions for the applicant? I have a question for staff, actually. Uh -huh. Councilmember Freeman? Uh, specifically around the on site traffic study, I know that request has come in often. Is, is there, um, I'm recognizing that this is not a requirement. Is there, like, is there anything you can? glean from the way in which this traffic study was done that might be applicable to future traffic studies? I believe Bill Judge is coming up to address that. Uh, yes, uh, Bill Judge, transportation. Uh, yeah, traffic impact study was not required of this development due to the number of units. I am not certain if the applicant maybe did one to share with the neighbors. If so, they did not share it with our office, so we have not seen anything. So just to follow up on Councilmember Freeman's question, that, that study was, was privately, um, that, that was a study that was uh, privately financed by the applicant then? Is that what I'm understanding? Yes, it, it was privately financed by the applicant. And uh, the study was done in a, and absolutely voluntary, but again, trying to allay any concerns that uh, residents had had. Um, one of the things we did in that study uh, you actually had individuals who actually did the traffic count situation. And they would go to uh, areas similar to what we would have in this development, such as I think, um, uh, what's the name of your townhomes? <coughs> Weldon Downs uh, off of Hope Valley Road, and then over at Crowsdale, and <coughs> we do a count there. And what we found was that actually, uh, the table that uh, you all use uh, for determining uh, traffic and traffic counts, uh, we found that we were only like one car or one trip different from what we found, found on actually on the ground checking to make sure what it was. And the residents and neighbors were very pleased that, uh, that we were able to do that uh, and show that consistency with you all's established plan. Thank you. Other questions for the applicant or for staff at this time? Um, specifically around the reduced um, units from 58 to 48 and then down to 38. Uh, how is, is that factoring into this price point? Is that why it's so high? Uh, we had always planned to have them uh, competitive or um, comparative to what's existing there now. Um, and so even with, with more, we still would have wanted to have a, a, a high level uh, there. So it, it's, it's that high because that there are areas that call for this uh, in the urban tier and not just the suburban part of Durham. Uh, so that's the relationship, I guess, could best answer. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just be clear about one thing, make sure I have my understanding right, that the that what we're voting on tonight is not a density of 38. What we're, de what we're voting on tonight and what has been stipulated in the development plan is 46 units. 40, 46. You know, when you say that, and Mr. Stanzial, I believe you said that there's been an agreement. That's not an agreement with our planning department. That's, I would assume, some sort of informal agreement with the neighborhood is what you're referring to. Is that right? That, that's a corollary agreement. 
uh, this would be what, 46? And that would be equivalent to six units an acre. Okay. Yeah. Other, other comments or questions? Uh, Councilmember Caballero? Yeah, why are you going from 46 to 38? Excuse me? Why are you going from 46 to 38? Like, why are you going down again? As I said, we had to do a lot of juggling to be able to get, uh, to meet the comprehensive plan and to meet the requests of the neighbors. And in the process of doing it, we had to restrict our actual rezoning uh, plot uh, to be able to keep it within, within uh, the requisite uh, six to 12 units an acre. Does that help you at all? Yeah. Yeah, George, you can go ahead too. <clears throat> so, um, just real quick, so what the the planning commission voted on would have been on the 46? Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure. So you have, okay. The, four, the 46 is, allows us to stay within the comprehensive plan. So, and it's six, six units an acre. Mm -hmm. And we had to, as we were going through all of our meetings with neighbors, we had, we were constantly uh, re adjusting and reducing the size of our zoning boundary in order to stay within the, we, we were not interested in changing the comprehensive plan. So the only way that we could do, we could meet the comprehensive plan and get to a number that the, that the neighborhood was, was happy with was to reduce the size, get down to six units an acre, 46 units, and then take advantage of the 20% reduction at site plan, which gets us down to the 38. Thank you. I just also want to acknowledge that you are going to have a high bar now with community engagement in front of us. Well, we've always had a high bar. So. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying, like, how many meetings did you all have? I just hope that this is a very affluent community and they have a lot of, um, and we've seen this with other communities, so I just hope that when you all have projects where maybe people aren't as organized, that you do the work. Thank you, Council Madam, Member. Madam Council Member, may I just respond to that? I think you were fine with uh, George Stanzel and, and, and with me. I think Council Members know. Uh, it was not just um, the affluence of the neighborhood. Uh, we've had, we have done this in all types of neighborhoods and have worked extremely hard with those neighborhoods that uh, certainly aren't in anywhere near as affluent here. But our task has always been and the council has always respected the fact that they want these developers to come into Durham to respect how you do business. And you do business by making sure that we are going to work with neighborhoods uh, to be not only consistent with the plans, but to also be compatible with their neighborhoods or to be an asset to their neighborhood. So I can assure you that our history of 30 years of working here on these in Durham that this council and other councils will tell you that we are one development team that will make sure that every neighborhood, regardless of how much they have or how much they make and the value of their property, that they're gonna get the same respect. And I think this team and this developer recognize that and they know that's how we operate and that's why they hired us. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you. Other, other comments from council, uh, other questions for the applicant or for um, staff at this time? I just have a few comments if you want to. I'm going to close the public hearing and then we'll have comments, okay? Um, is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this matter? Is there anyone here in the room that would like to be heard on this matter before we close the public hearing? Mr. Pollard, you have three minutes. My name is Larry Pollard. I live at 1902 Cedar Street, about two blocks from this uh, proposed redevelopment. At our first meeting with the developers and with the neighborhood people, I told everyone, I've lived in the neighborhood for 70 years, 70 years, and I had seen lots of change over 70 years. So I'm not afraid of the change that will come. I'm confident that it will be a positive change, not only for our neighborhood, 
but for the entire city. And I look forward to seeing these gentlemen complete their task. I have felt all along through the negotiations with our neighbors and with the neighbors negotiating with the team that there was progress being made on getting this project to fit in and to be the right type of project that the Siemens family and all of us who live in the neighborhood would like to have. And I want to congratulate the team for what they have done to meet with us, talk with the people involved, and to position us for the future. And I think it's going to be a grand future. I look forward to it. I commend them for the efforts they have made. In closing, I would like to say that I am very sorry about my dear friend, James Siemens. And I hope that this will be a legacy to his memory and his family for a long time to come in our city. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Pollard. Is there anyone else here who would like to be heard on this item? It's a public hearing item. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed, and I'm going to uh, now ask for remarks from members of the council, if any, and then we will be uh, voting on this item. I'm going to just begin by saying that um, I, I want, I hope that you all will please pass on uh, Bob and others our condolences uh, to Margaret uh, and the family. Um, it's a tremendous loss, and uh, uh, James was a friend of mine as well. Uh, uh, Mary was a good friend, and Jim and and Jenny, uh, and uh, I know that James's loss is just a terrible loss, and so I hope that on behalf of myself and the council and the community, uh, you will pass that on to, uh, to Margaret. Council members, uh, we now have this item before us, and I'm going to ask for any comments that you may have, and uh, then we will uh, take the matter up. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Councilmember Freeman. I would also like to add my sincere condolences for the Siemens family and friends. <clears throat> I recognize the history and the magnitude of what this estate means to the Durham community, and I am so grateful and thankful I've had the opportunity to watch this process unfold the way that it has. Um, again, similar to last month's, um, I'm sorry, not last month, but the last council meeting where you have a situation where folks who are of means creating more transparency, more accountability, more conversation about what the way in which planning and the planning process works. Um, ex ex explicitly, the way in which developers work with the community and uh, making sure that they fit in. And I really appreciate, like I think it's under said how many, how many man hours have gone into this, not just from the developer side, but from the community side, these are volunteers, people who live in the neighborhood who de decide to lead a charge to make sure that what their neighborhood needs gets addressed. And I am so thankful that I have had the opportunity to watch this happen. I, I mean, speaking as a former member of the Planning Commission, I've said it about a, a lot of times, I won't go there. But it's, it's important to make sure that we're, we're not just, as, as Council Member um, Caballero mentioned, paying attention to this in the instances where it's a, a matter of, of people with, with means. And I specifically, I'm thinking around how in which we're moving forward with light rail and lots of other different projects. It's important to make sure that you engage the people where they are, how they are, to address their concerns, because otherwise it just builds into a, an argument. And it's, I mean, I, I realized, I think I was on the Planning Commission when it initially came up. And I know like the, the tenor of the conversation was not this admirable. There wasn't 15 folks in support of and no one against. And so I recognize that, that this has taken a lot of work and I really um, am so appreciative. It speaks volumes to who you know, Mary Duke Biddle um, Siemens was and the work that she's done in this community with your mom, Mr. Spaulding. And, so many others and so many will continue to do. And I'm just, I'm, I mean, I, I have a great deal of gratitude for the way that things have worked out. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> you had told me a year ago, six months ago, 
not that long ago that we'd be here tonight without folks in opposition to this rezoning, I would have said you were insane. Um, but here we are tonight, and I think that's a testament to two things. Number one, the hard work that the development team has done. Um, I've never seen a development plan with text commitments quite like this. Um, I've only been on the council for a little over three years. Um, but I can't remember 19 text commitments and five uh, separate design commitments, especially one that actually cites a piece of literature, the Field Guide to American Homes, the second edition, um, and talking about the general architectural style of the residence <laughs> that will be built uh, in this particular project. And second, I think to the folks who live uh, near uh, this project, uh, they are, um, I think many of us were, were copied on a number of emails about this, uh, this particular process early on. Um, and to see that community uh, willing to work with y'all uh, to find an answer that works uh, for this particular part of our city was truly inspiring. Um, and I think that's, a, like I said, it's a testament to them, but also to your, you and your team. Um, and I really appreciate that. Um, so that's the only thing I wanted to add, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Anyone else have comments? Council Member Middleson? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you uh, to all of you. I want to uh, congratulate the developer on what seems to have been a rather aggressive um, campaign to uh, achieve cohesion uh, in the neighborhood. Um, I also want to congratulate you on your business acumen. It seemingly, I, and I don't want to mischaracterize what I heard, it seems like the price points were static. And yet, uh, moving from one level uh, of units down to a lower level of units is still maintaining um, profitability uh, with lesser units, but a static price point um, is commendable. I, I just want to say for the record, though, I lament uh, that somehow we got below a threshold where a, um, a donation was, was, was possible uh, to our um, affordable housing fund, but uh, commend you on still your, your profitability and um, for your your uh, successful campaign with residents there. I intend to support the rezoning. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. <clears throat> Any more comments by members of the Council? Um, if not, uh, we have in front of us, uh, would anyone like to move to adopt the consistency statement? So moved. Second. We move that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. Consistency statement passes 7-0. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt an ordinance to amend the UDO? I moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance amending the United De Unified Development Ordinance. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. And we will now be moving on to, we'll be moving back to item six. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, we're going to be moving first to item six, Ms. Sunyak. I'm going to ask uh, uh, Mr. Johnson if he would like to. Uh, also, note, Council Member Freeman has left the dais. It's her question. Okay. I, I think we'll. we'll Council Member Freeman, uh, we're on item six. Uh, and so if you could come back, and did you have a question for uh, count for uh, staff on item six? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Just for clarity on the Section 8 vouchers. Uh, Reginald Johnson, Director of the Department of Community Development. Uh, in response to your question, Council Member, I have confirmed that the CASA does uh, accept Section 8 vouchers. I have confirmed that with the DHA tonight, as well as it does appear on their website. And we know from our monitoring that the majority of the persons in Denson and as well as uh, Underwood and Maplewood are receiving vouchers. And I just want to make sure that I'm clear. So I received this information based on someone who has a Section 8 voucher, and they called in to see if they could be accepted. And so it might be advisable that they speak with their staff about letting folks know that the Section 8 vouchers are actually acceptable. Okay. We'll do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. We'll now move to act on item six. Uh, do I hear a motion uh, to, I believe we can do this with we'll a single this, vote. Can we not, Mr. Attorney? That's correct. Thank you. Can we now vote uh, to approve item six? I'm sorry. Can we have a motion to approve item six? 
Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve item six. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. We'll now move to item 21, uh, zoning map change for Shell Oil gas station. Ms. Sunyak. Good evening, Jamie Sunyak with the planning department. Request for a zoning map change has been received from Ash Miller of MLA Design Group for a 2.879 acre track of land generally located at 1102 uh, NC54 at the corner of NC54 and Barbie Road. <clears throat> the site is presently split zoned with the fort front portion being residential suburban 20 and the rear portion being office and institutional. Ms. Miller proposes to change the um, 0.65 acre portion of the property which is residential suburban 20 and 1.35 acres of the office and institutional to uh, general commercial, I'm sorry, commercial neighborhood with a development plan, CND. The development plan associated with this request proposes an expansion of an existing gas station, which will include a total of eight fueling positions and a pay station building. The property is designated commercial and office on the future land use map. There's no change to the office designation. The commercial designation is consistent with their zoning request. Key commitments associated with this plan include limiting the use to the fuel sales, dedicating additional right-of-way along Barbie Road and NC54 to allow for constructing additional turn lanes and other roadway improvements. The Durham Planning Commission at their October 9th, 2018 meeting recommended approval of the proposed commercial neighborhood CND zoning district by a vote of nine to zero. Staff determines that, this request, that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Two motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt a consistency statement and the second is for the zoning ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sunyak. Uh, we will, uh, you have heard the report from staff. I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. And first I'm gonna ask if there are any questions by members of the council for the staff. <clears throat> hearing none, I'm gonna, uh, we have two speakers who've signed up to speak on item 21. Mr. Daniel Dinsbeer and Mr. Scott Miller. Mr. Dinsbeer and Mr. Miller, would you all please come over here to my right? Uh, and both, of, both speakers are proponents. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on item 21? All right, sir, are you a proponent or an opponent? All right, that's fine. Uh, I'll hear from these two gentlemen and then I'll call on you. All right, thank you. Sir, please give us your name and uh, address, please. Uh, Daniel Dinsbeer. I'm from uh, 1540 Sally's Creek Parkway, Winston-Salem. I'm uh, with Quality Oil Company, and uh, we're, I've got our civil engineer here to answer questions. I think the staff report has covered uh, what we've done to make this a safer place to, to do business. And uh, it's an existing location, as most of you are aware. And uh, so uh, we're just trying to become a conforming use. So. Thank you. And as your, uh, Mr. Miller, would you also like to speak or are you here to answer questions? All right, thank you very much. Sir, uh, please come forward to the podium, uh, give us your name and address, and uh, then you can uh, ask your question. Um, I apologize for not filling out a form, it's my first time at a council meeting. No problem. Uh, Russ Gilbertson, I live at 1509 Catchfly Lane, which is the uh, Meadows at South Point neighborhood right behind that gas station corner. And the two questions, and I, I've not had an opportunity to review the materials, um, the current pumps that are there, um, do not appear to allow the 54 extension to go through unimpeded when that extension goes through in, I don't know, is it 12 or 15 years? So I'm, I'm curious if this zoning change makes a setback requirements for access to the actual lanes, because there's quite a bit of traffic when people try and pull in to get gas there. That was question one. And question two is uh, the, get, the sidewalk um, ends where Meadows at South Point, the developer finished, and it's now just basically wide open. Are there plans to finish that sidewalk up to the um, Barbie 54 intersection? Mr. Two, thank you. I'm going to, Ms. Sunyak, would you say they were both questions for the applicant? Would be able, or would you, are there questions that you have the answers to? Uh, 
Um, I would say there are questions for the applicant at this time. All right, thank you. Uh, so, so he is accurate. That's it's correct that the pump in their current position are in the what would be the right of way, and we are proposing to dedicate a new 35 foot right of way strip through there. Uh, we've worked closely with Bill Judge and your transportation department. Uh, we've created a bike lane. We are extending the sidewalks down through there. So, we've actually addressed those two issues uh, in our uh, uh, in our uh, uh, recommendation for what we're doing. So, thank you, Ms. Sunyak. Do you agree with that? Thank you. Sir, did you hear the answer to your questions? With, oh, right, great, thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on this item? Anyone else that would like to speak on this item? If not, I'm gonna declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Uh, we would need first a motion to adopt a consistency statement. <coughs> I'm sorry, Council Member Reese, my, my, my fault, go ahead. Fine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First of all, I wanted to thank the Durham resident who came tonight even though we'd never been to a meeting and never spoken up, uh, you had questions and you got them answered. I, I respect the heck out of that, so thank you for doing that. <sighs> you, did, you did great. You were great. Okay. Yep. Um, I'm uh, actually a little upset because he stole one of my questions, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. um, and I vaguely knew about the sidewalk, glad to hear that confirmed, but I, the one thing I've heard about this intersection is those gas pumps on the corner. Well, not so much from the 54 widening perspective, but just because folks who live in that area uh, have been concerned for many years about the safety of having a pump so close to a very busy intersection that's getting much busier, uh, thanks in part to decisions made by this council about zoning in that area. And so uh, really excited to see that that, uh, that hazardous situation will be mitigated by this plan and intend to support it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, council member. Um, and now, uh, are there any other comments by members of the council? If not, I'll accept a motion on the consistency statement. So moved. Second. Move that we adopt a consistency statement. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you. And now I'll accept a motion to adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. And now we'll move on to item 22, consolidated annexation for Ravenstone Conover. Good evening, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. Request for utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and an, and an initial zoning map change has been received from John Blackley Eden Lands for a 0 0.469 <coughs> acre track or acre parcel of land located at 629 uh, Conover Road. The parcel requesting annexation and the adjacent lot fronting Conover Road, which is already within the city limits, are owned by the same owner. The applicant intends on combining the two lots and making them one buildable lot to be developed with one house. The site is presently zoned rural residential, and staff recommends an exact translation of the zoning designation, which is the least intense designation based upon the size of the lot and the suburban tier policies. The parcel is designated as a low density residential on the comprehensive plan, future land use map, which is consistent with the rezoning request. If approved, the annexation petition and the initial zoning change would become effective on December 31st, 2018. The Public Works and Water Management Departments have determined that the existing water and sewer mains have the capacity for the proposed development. Budget, management, budget and Management Service Departments determined that the proposed annexation will have a positive fiscal impact immediately upon annexation, and additional information can be found in the staff report. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Three motions are required for this application. The first is required by law to approve the utility extension agreement and the voluntary annexation petition. And the second is to adopt a consistency statement. Um, and the third is for the zoning ordinance. Thank you, Ms. Sunyak. You have now heard the report from staff. I'm gonna declare this public hearing open. I have one person who has signed up to speak on this item, Mr. Eden's opponent. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to speak on item 22? Is there anyone else that would like to speak on item 22? Mr. Edens? 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just here in case there's questions. All right. Thank you for being here. Uh, council members, um, well, first of all, let me ask, is there anyone else that would like to speak? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Uh, we can adopt, uh, the, if, if there are no questions or comments, I will take a motion to adopt the ordinance annexing Ravenstone Conover into the city of Durham. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance annexing Raven Conover into the city of Durham. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Uh, the second motion would be to adopt the consistency statement. So moved, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. So you already have. Thank you. Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Great. And then on uh, motion three to adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. Ordinance passes 7-0. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Mr. Edens. I will now move to item 23. Uh, this is the consolidated annexation for Carrington Woods. Good evening, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. Request for a utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and zoning map change has been received from Glenwood Homes, LLC, for a contiguous 8.57-acre track generally located at 833 Clayton Road. The subject site is presently zoned Residential Suburban 20, and the applicant is requesting a zoning designation of Residential Suburban 10, which is consistent with the low-density residential designation on the future land use map of the city's comprehensive plan. No development plan was submitted in conjunction with this request. Please note that the Unified Development Ordinance permits the same uses in the RS-20 and the RS-10 districts. If approved, this request would allow for new lots at a minimum of 10,000 square feet instead of 20,000 square feet. The Public Works and Water Management Departments have determined that the existing City of Durham utility mains have the capacity for the proposed development. The budget and uh, management service departments determined that the proposed annexation will become uh, revenue positive immediately following the annexation. Additional information can be found in the staff report. If approved, the annexation and zoning map change would become effective on December 31st, 2018. Mm -hmm. The Durham Planning Commission at their August 14th 2008 meeting did not recommend approval of the proposed residential suburban 10 zoning district by a vote of 2 to 11. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Three motions are required for this application. The first is required by law to approve the utility extension agreement and the voluntary annexation petition. The second is required to adopt a consistency statement and the third is for the zoning ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sonyak, and thank you for the good job you do on these public hearing items. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, we're going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to, you've heard from staff, I'm going to declare this public hearing open. Uh, I have one, two, three, four, five speakers. I have one speaker, Jacob Levan who is li listed as a proponent. I have Kenneth Wiggins, who's listed as an opponent. And then I have three other speakers who have listed themselves neither as proponents or opponents. And so I'm going to ask those folks, if they're here today, uh, to please identify whether or not you're a proponent and opponent. Let me explain why I do this. I have to give equal time to proponents and opponents on a public hearing matter. And so it's important to know which you are. I'm not asking this just for an idle reason. So is Ms. Lillian Grice here? Ms. Grice, are you a, a proponent or an opponent of this, Rita? Opponent. Okay. Um, Natalie Russell? Natalia Russell, I'm sorry. Opponent? Okay. And Quincy Ratliff? Okay. Opponent. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. Mr. Levan? Great. Mr. Levan, um, I'm going to... 
Let's see, so we have four opponents. Is there anyone else who is here tonight that would like to speak on this item before I uh, parse out the time for this item? Anyone else? All right. Mr. LeVan, I'm going to give you 12 minutes, and I'll be giving each of the opponents three minutes each, okay? So the opponents and the proponents will both have 12 minutes. You don't have to take the entire time, of course. Neither side does, but that's, that's the amount of time that you have. Right. All right. Well, I'm Jacob LeVan uh, at 9220 Fairbanks Drive in Raleigh. I'm here on behalf of the Penny Engineering Design, which is the firm that was hired to carry out the design of this proposed neighborhood. Um, I won't do too much recap, but as you know, the property is currently zoned RS-20, and we're requesting it to be rezoned to the RS-10, um, which is consistent with the Durham Future Land Use Map. Uh, the property is about eight and a half acres, surrounded on all sides by RS-10 zoning, and uh, each of the three surrounding neighborhoods, as you can see on your map, also have stubs to our property. And according to the UDO, we are required to tie our proposed streets to all three of those stubs. So we'll kind of be the interconnector of the whole community, I guess. Um, we have applied for a utility extension agreement, and it's our intention to extend the public utilities into the proposed neighborhood. Um, in our experience, the RS-20 lots are typically found more in areas that uh, don't have access to public utilities and therefore need you know, more space on their lot for their septic system and their well system and things like that. And uh, that paired with the surrounding uh, zoning all being RS-10, we feel that these are pretty good reasons that the RS-10 lots would better suit the, not only the proposed development on our part, but also the surrounding area, being that they would be the interconnector of all the surrounding developments. Um, we, while we did not have a, a provide a development plan with the uh, with this request when we started the process. Um, we do have current sketches, and with our current sketches, we have been able to fit a maximum of 23 lots on the RS-10 and 16 lots on the RS-20. Um, I realize without the development plan being officially attached, the numbers probably don't mean much, but I assure you we're talking about a difference of, at most, seven lots. Um, so we feel pretty strongly that the, the difference in the impacts of the RS-20 zoning versus the RS-10 zoning will be pretty minimal. Um, it also appears to us that this community area was kind of well planned by the city of Durham as well as the surrounding developments for a continuation of a similar neighborhood, which would require the RS-10 zoning. Um, for all these reasons, it seems to us that it would be kind of an oddity to place an RS-20 neighborhood right in the center of an RS-10 community. So um, I don't think I need the rest of my nine minutes, and I'm sure there's other people here that would like to speak, so thank I'd you. like to defer the rest of my time to them. And uh, Mr. LeVan, uh, the way we'll, we do this is after the opponents speak, if you have additional comments you would like to make, you can reserve the rest of your time, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. All righty, now we're going to hear from the opponents, and I'm, uh, first I'm going to call uh, Mr. Kenneth Wiggins, and I'm going to ask all the speakers to please come over here to my right now uh, to line up over here. That will be first Mr. Wiggins, second Quincy Ratliff, third Lillian Grice, and fourth Natalia Russell. If the four of you all could come over here to the side, that would be great, and I'll begin with Mr. Wiggins. Mr. Wiggins, could you please come to the podium uh, and give us your name and address, and we're glad to have you, and you have three minutes. Uh, my name is Kenneth Wiggins. I live at 14 Meadowcrest Drive, um, which is uh, behind the uh, area that's being developed. And um, I'm not a very good public speaker, but... <laughs> Mr. Wiggins, um, not a problem. No yeah. <laughs> But just wanted to uh, to just uh, kind of voice my opinion on what's going on, because it's happening in our backyard. So um, we've had uh, just two meetings with the committee, and I guess the committee kind of said um, no to the project. Um, and I guess this one we want to come uh, here also. Um, first, we were kind of concerned about um, they were going to develop wetlands, which um, 
behind us, like been there for 15 years. And when I first moved in there, they said that um, you know, no development would happen behind us ever. But of course, times have changed, things have changed, and here we are. Um, so when we met with the developer, uh, first uh, we asked her for a development plan. And uh, that's like a library we met at. And she didn't want to meet all, any of our requests. So she said she wasn't going to have a development plan. So we were like, um, well, OK. Then how can we know what you're going to plan to do behind our residence? You know? And you know, she said, no, she wasn't going to do that. So when we met here with the committee, we, we presented that to them too. And, um, and some of the concerns that we had were um, that the area was already like really congested. Uh, it's across from Southern High School. And like when the school's in and we're trying to get out of our development, it's really tough uh, trying to get on the Clayton Road. That's one of the main issues we brought up. Um, we also was asking her about uh, exits that would be um, from the development, like onto Clayton Road and to some other developments that my neighbors were at. Um, she was like, well, she couldn't promise us how they were going to do the exits and how the traffic was going to flow and all that. So we were like, OK. And um, also, it's like we weren't, we weren't trying to like stop development or stop growth or anything like that. We just was trying to come and talk and fight for uh, how it's going to lessen the impact of our community and where we live. Um, so we wanted to make that clear to her. We weren't trying to like, we don't want nothing built behind our homes or we so used to nothing being back there that we weren't going to change. That wasn't the issue. We just wanted to find out from her just how much of an impact it would have. And she wasn't really giving us any indication of that. Like at one point we came, it was like 17 homes. Then it was 23 homes. And then if she didn't have a development plan, it could be up to maybe 30 homes. And we were like, well, that's the big difference between 17 and 18 homes and 30 homes. Because you know we have a lot of foot traffic, kids going to school, uh, people trying to get out to go to work. A lot of things are going on right there in that um, little area. So I just want to say, I'm sorry. But that's what I want to say, that we're just trying to lessen the impact of what's going to go on. Thank you. You did, a, you did a very good job, Mr. Wiggins. Thank you. I will now hear from Mr. Quincy, Ms. Quincy Ratliff. I'm sorry. Ms. Ratliff. Uh, Please give us your name and address. Welcome, and you have three minutes. Okay. Quincy Ratcliffe. My address is 3219 Woodland Park. Uh, my house is, a, is the main entrance of which they were projecting to have Carrington Woods flow into, which is at the corner of Woodland Park and Derry Road. Um, I support everything Mr. Wiggins said. We're not opposed to the growth of the area. Um, we were just not clear on what their de development plan is, and we have not been given one as of today's date. Um, and the other concern was who's going to hold them accountable to the number of homes that they place in those on that lot or on that property. Um, our questions were not addressed, so that's why we're here again today, trying to figure out exactly what are the plans and no one is addressing the safety or the lack of safety that's in that area. With Southern High School being there and the students walking to and from school, we do not have sidewalks in that area. Um, also, the pedestrians who have to walk for city transportation, sidewalks are not there either. So our concerns are more so, or my concern is more so safety and also the main entrance being next to where my home is, which we have a high degree of traffic in that area. And we have already had three accidents on the Woodland Park Road. Um, so if those concerns could be addressed with us, if someone could sit down, maybe the developer could sit down and actually address that with us, we will be more than happy to um, accept whatever they, whatever it's workable between the groups. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Radcliffe. Uh, now Lillian Grice, please. Ms. Grice, welcome. You also have three minutes. Could you give us your name and address? Yes, my name is Lillian Grice. I am at the corner of 2 Meadowcrest Drive. My concern is the same as my neighbor's safety. I've had several. I've been in my home 24 years. 
I've had several cars run up into my yard, into the trees behind my yard, one this close from hitting my house. That is a, a sharp curve and it's a blind spot. And a lot of times when you're trying to get out, you're this close to getting hit with someone coming from the opposite direction. Um, my concern is if you're gonna build a development, why can't they have their own entrance as opposed to opening up these other roads? Because now you have Twin Lakes, you've got all these other developments that will also come through. So it's not just us, the new development and the development on the other side. Now you've got all the Twin Lakes, people coming off Chandler Road, you know, the bus garage is there. So the traffic is just, you know, sometimes you just can't get out. So that's my concern being on that corner. Also digging up my yard. You know, it's been several times I've come home and the city has dug up my yard. No one notified me. I, my, lot, my yard is painted different colors. There are wires running. You know, I know I'm on an easeway, but nobody notifies me when work is being done. So I'm wondering, is this the same thing that the guy is talking about, that they're gonna have to run everything through my yard for this new development, being that I am on that corner? The questions have not been answered. Thank you, Ms. Grice, I appreciate it. Now we'll hear from uh, Natalia Russell. Ms. Russell, please give us your name and address, and you have three minutes. Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. My name is Natalia Russell. Um, I reside at 3301 Woodland Park, and um, my house is directly on the corner of which the main entrance for Carrington Woods is supposed to be built. Um, I feel like I'm reiterating a lot of the concerns because like all my neighbors, and I concur with everything they said, that none of our um, concerns that we've brought up, and I think it's been a total of three meetings, has ever been addressed. So um, I won't stay long because um, they brought up a lot of things. Um, concerns still with the foot traffic of the students, the safety of our students at Southern High School. As stated earlier, there are no sidewalks. So there are students, a good portion of them walking to and from schools during peak hours. Woodland Park, um, right after you pass Freeman, there is a really sharp curve before you are able to access Woodland Park. I myself have been, um, almost been in several accidents because people are coming around the curve so fast um, and they don't realize that um, people are trying to access the Twin Lakes neighborhood. Uh, one of the other concerns was, you know, has DOT come out and actually assessed the neighborhood properly? Have they ever come out? That was never really answered. And when they came out, what areas did they assess? Because there's currently, well, even back in August, there was um, two new subdivisions coming on Freeman Road. Those subdivisions are now in development. Um, construction is, is taking place. And there are two substantially sized um, sub subdivisions that are going on Freeman Road. So that those two subdivisions, I don't think, was assessed in this plan. And um, once they're, you know, they're built, that's going to already impact the neighborhood that's already congested. Um, I will add that going to work on a day-to-day -day basis today with the current traffic is tedious. I sat on Clayton Road trying to access Cheek Road for a matter of about 25 minutes. And this was between the hours of 7.30 and 8 o'clock in the morning. We have not even addressed when there is extracurricular activities at Southern High School, basketball, football, I mean, none of those things have been addressed as far as the current traffic, and we're talking about adding more traffic. Um, I mean, I have a lot of concerns being on the corner that this is going to be a um, main entrance. How would that work with the bus, the buses? Is there a bus that's gonna be able to access uh, Carrington Woods? I mean, as nice as the neighborhood sounds, um, it doesn't make it doesn't make good sense for the existing residents of Twin Lakes, Meadowcrest, Clayton Crossing. Um, I'm opposed to it totally. I know that they can build, but it doesn't make sense, excuse me, to me to wedge another neighborhood in the middle of three existing residents. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you very you. much for your comments. 
All righty. Um, Mr. LeVan, uh, you have some remaining time. Madam Clark, do you know how much remaining time Mr. LeVan has? Mr. LeVan has nine minutes. Mr. LeVan, could you please respond to uh, some of the concerns that you heard from the neighbors? Yes, sir. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank them for coming out and speaking their mind. Uh, while they do oppose me, I do respect that they came out here and took the time out of their schedule to come to the meeting. Um, as for their concerns, uh, Mr. Wiggins mentioned something about the wetlands on the property. Uh, we since have had a um, stream determination perfor performed on the area. And I don't want to say it wrong, so I'm going to read it straight off the paper. Um, each stream that has been checked has been determined to not be at least intermittent or is not present. So that's about all I have for those streams. As for the safety factor on Clayton Road, um, I don't have the exact numbers. I think they're in your packet. And I know that uh, transportation can uh, attest to this. But the current capacity for Clayton Road, I believe, is around 11,000. And the current AADT on the road is only 7,000. I believe our development's only proposing maybe 100 to 200 trips a day on the road. So it's, it's minimal impact. Even if we got our maximum 23 lots on the, on the property, we're still significantly smaller than all of the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, that was the primary reason for not having a connection to Clayton Road. But the other reason is that the NCDOT requires a minimum of 1,000 feet between intersections of this type. And we simply do not have that that room to put an entrance onto Clayton Road. So that's why we had to tie to the surrounding neighborhoods as well as the UDO, which required us to sub to all three of the existing subs. Mm -hmm. That's all I have for that. Thank you very much. You. Can I ask you, um, the, the applicants, I'm sorry, the opponents, also raised the question of the uh, development plan. Uh, you said that you're going to put 23, no more than 23 units there. Um, but as you know, uh, you're able to put more units there. Could you talk about why you all decided not to um, include a development plan? Yes, sir. Um, well, honestly, at the beginning of the process, looking at the future land use map and the surrounding areas, we thought that this was going to be a very straightforward zoning request. So we did not attach <coughs> a development plan to it. Um, we did have a, a neighborhood meeting, although it wasn't required. And most of these neighbors, as well as others, uh, attended the meeting. Um, we did provide the sketch of the 23 lots at the meeting. It was on a board up on the wall for everyone to see. We talked about it the entire meeting. Um, that sketch has not changed one bit since then, and it is still a maximum of 23 lots. There is, with the open space requirements and the, the fact that we have to stub to all three of those roads, there is no way that we have fit more than 23 lots on that property. I don't know where the number 30 came from, but 23 is the max that we will be able to get. All right, thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna ask the staff some questions. A lot of questions, a whole lot of questions. Um, so the, um, do you have any comments on the, on the wetlands streams question that the opponents raised and Mr. LeVan's comments? Um, so if, Jamie Sanyak with the planning department, if there are wetlands or streams um, that uh, need to be regulated, they would have to adhere to the UDO requirements. Um, wetlands over one acre or more would be subject to um, buffer requirements. The applicant, um, as uh, indicated, has the ability to ask for a stream determination to determine whether or not a buffer is required uh, that can be done prior to um, a application or during the application process at the time of site plan. Um, so if they've made that determination at this point, then um, we would adhere to that. Right. So I just wanted to make clear to the, the opponents that um, is, if I'm stating this right, Ms. Sonyak, or wrong, tell me if I'm saying this wrong. So the, the applicant if, if there is a wetlands or an intermittent stream there that has to be protected, there would have to be buffers provided, and that would happen at a later point in the process, at site plan. So uh, that is something that 
would happen later on down the road, but there would be a requirement to protect any wetland or intermittent stream with buffering. Is that right, Ms. Sunyak? If there's no development plan as part of an application, then it would be at the time of site plan that those um, issues would be addressed. Okay. Um, so it seems like one of the big problems with the development uh, and the opponents is the situation with the three stub outs, as well as the, um, the situation on Clayton Road the applicant says that uh, because of the re distance required between intersections that um, he's not able to put a, 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 at least the way I heard this, he's not able to put an exit from the development onto Clayton Road. Is that true? You're going to ask for reinforcements from Mr. Judge? <laughs> Always a wise idea. Yes, Bill Judge, Transportation. Uh, since there's not a development plan um, at the time of site plan, uh, the ordinance would require a connection to all existing streets, which would include Clayton in this case. However, as the applicant has indicated, due to the existing intersection spacing and the curvature of the road, it's very likely they would uh, likely go to NCDOT to get basically a letter from or decision from them that they would not allow it, in which case the yeah, the planning director would likely not rule that it would not be required if DOT is not going to allow a connection. So if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying that you think it likely that the state DOT would not allow the, 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 the development to put an entrance onto Clayton? Correct, due to site distance concerns and intersection spacing concerns along Clayton. Okay. And, and Mr. Judge, I understand you say that even if they did allow that connection to Clayton, the UDO would still require the interconnects to all the, the three existing stub outs? Yes. Thank you. So the developer, so without a development plan, uh, you, I think I'm hearing you say that either with or without the development plan, uh, a, without with or without a development plan, it's unlikely that DOT would allow the entrance onto Clayton. Is that correct? That's correct. I guess the only difference, if there were a development plan, there probably would be a arrow shown there with a asterisk or a note saying that they reserve the right to request a waiver at time of site plan for that connection. And would there, is there a likelihood that that waiver would be granted given if DOT disapproved it? Um, well, no, I would, I would defer to the planning director, but if NCDOT um, did not, I mean, if NCDOT indicated that an entrance would be allowed, then I think it, it would be required. If they indicated it would not be required, not be allowed, then the waiver would likely be approved. I just want trying to be clear that, again, that is it your estimation that DOT would not allow an entrance onto Clayton Road? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, and that means that there are the three stub outs that the development is required to connect to. Correct. If there was a development plan, that might not be true. Is that correct? Uh, correct. Although, I mean, if there are wetlands or other environmental features near any of those three, they could get a similar waiver to, to Clayton just like we discussed. And what would that waiver mean? And they would need to basically show what environmental feature there is there that would prevent the connection. In order to, they would have to make, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm asking no. questions. Of, I, 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 my ignorance is showing up. But if, they're a, if they have to make the connection, they, they're, they're required to make the connection to the three stub outs, unless there's an environmental feature that would say they could right. would that not. would preclude yeah. the connection. Yes, and those and that environmental is that true with or without a development plan? Yes. And if there was a development plan, how would that change that situation? Well, the just because of some of the existing conditions that they would pick up, we probably have a better indication whether or not there were those features there. Got it. Um, and. Um, Yeah. 
Mr. Judge, what would you say, with your expertise, would be the best way to handle the traffic uh, in and out of this potential development? Well, we do prefer the connectivity in each direction to basically spread the traffic out as much as possible so that it's not all concentrated at one point. I think a lot of the concerns I heard from the existing residents out there, primarily, I think she indicated around 8.30, which is a peak time for Southern High School traffic entering. So while there's not a capacity problem on, on Clayton Road from a 24-hour standpoint, there <laughs> certainly probably are um, short periods of time, particularly associated with the high school where, where traffic is significant. All right, thanks. Um, I may have some other questions, but I'm going to now uh, ask if there are other questions for the applicant or uh, for the staff from members of the council. Mr. Mayor. Council member. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a question for the applicant, Mr. Levan, if you don't mind. Thank you so much. Um, you said you anticipated it being a pretty straightforward rezoning. Yes, <coughs> in the presence of mind to have a sketch made. Who, who made the sketch? Excuse me? Who made the sketch that you alluded to, you alluded to? My boss, Penny of Penny Engineering. She developed the sketch plan. Okay. What, and forgive my ignorance, is, was, is the sketch significantly less expensive to generate than a development plan? Yes. Okay, I'm sure it was. All right. I think it would be, Council Member Middleton, maybe, maybe one thing that would be interesting to, for people to know is what the cost of a development plan is. So maybe we could hear from the planning staff about that. Would that be helpful? Would to me. Good evening, Pat Young with the Planning Department. So the, the cost of a development plan varies significantly based on the size and complexity of the development plan. But a, a development plan of this size would approximately would start at about fifteen thousand dollars and go up to about twenty five thousand dollars. Thank you. Fifteen to twenty five, you say, Mr. Mayor? Can I just interject real quick here? Um, a planning commissioner, um, one of the planning commissioners, explained the issue around development plan, um, and I'll just read what he says. In other cases, planning commission members have been sensitive to developers' objections to the cost of development plans for relatively small projects. In this case, there. This is this is Tom from Tom Miller, by the way. In this case, there really is no material cost issue in as much as the developer is able to produce her own development plan um, as, the, as, a, as the developer. This is not a small nonprofit uh, like was with the case we had, the, I think the Shriners came before us with a commercial development. This is a developer who can produce a development plan but has not. That's, I just wanted to add that when you were talking about cost. If, if I may just thank you for that, that, I think that's an important interjection. Was the sketch produced in anticipation of um, concerns raised by opponents, or or what, did you have it from the beginning? When when was the sketch produced? I don't believe the sketch was produced at the time that we had gone to originally start this process. Um, I can't speak for her. I wasn't hired until a couple months ago, so I wasn't around when the project originally started. So I, I can't answer with too much detail around when sketches happened and, and why exactly the development plan wasn't attached. But that's, that's all about all I have to say about that. I'm sorry. No, thank you, Mr. Levin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. What about this issue that Council Member Reese makes, Mr. Levin? Is, do, you think, do you think that's legitimate? That is, my, my reading of, of Mr. Miller's comments were not just that this was a develop. Let me, let me uh, Maybe you can help me, Charlie. Um, it wasn't just that this was a developer, but that there were certain particular, um, try to pull this up, my computer's not helping me at this minute. In this case, a developer is an engineer informed that she'll be doing her own land planning, including preparation of a site plan if the zoning is approved. Um, so what would you say about the cost of a development plan, Mr. Levan? The, the engineer, Penny Engineering, is not the developer. Mm -hmm. Glenwood Homes is the developer. 
Glenwood Homes has hired Penny Engineering to go about this process of getting the rezoning so that they have an idea of what how many lots they're going to have on this piece of property. So, Lin, so Linwood Homes would be paying for the the engineer for the development plan. Yes, sir. I assume it would be fifteen to twenty-five thousand. Right. Exactly. Okay. Um, Questions. Mr. Mayor, I might have a question, but one second. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we've had a couple cases lately where the issue of developing on wetlands has come up, and I'm just wondering if we have a definition of wetland. What makes an area a wetland, and then what are the requirements related to that designation? Uh, thank you for your question, Pat Young with Planning Department, um, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, we defer, um, we require that the applicant um, consult with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Our local district is based in Wilmington, North Carolina, and they have de very detailed criteria that look at things like aquatic life, aquatic vegetation uh, to define, uh, and there's field verification required. The Army Corps staff reviews this documentation and determines whether it is or is not a wetland. What our ordinance says is that if, it, if it's both determined a wetland by the Army Corps and it's an acre or larger, if it's smaller than an acre, it can be filled or modified. Mm -hmm. and that's very standard with other ordinances in North Carolina. So if it's larger than an acre, then it can't be developed at all? That's correct. It would have to be retained and buffered. I, but that designation hasn't, the, the process of getting that designation or not hasn't happened yet for this development? That's correct. Okay. And that's part of that fifteen to $25,000 cost associated with the development plan is doing that site work at this point in the process. But they have to do it at some point in the process? Yes, at okay. the time of site plan. Okay. Um, this is a traffic question. Um, what are the anticipated trips per day for this kind of development and then therefore what would be the increase in trips per day with a change from RS20 to RS10? So, uh, Bill Judge Transportation, the single family residential homes generate uh, right around 10 trips per day, slightly over 10 on average. So whether it's, yeah, RS, um, yeah, RS20 or RS10, it's really, yeah, just the number of lots. So it's almost twice as many. I think at RS20, we estimate at worst case, 15 single family lots, at, which generates 183 trips and uh, RS10, 30 single family lots at 347. Okay, thank you. Um, and a question for our applicant. Do you know what the price point is going to be for the houses? I do not know that information. I'm sorry. That would be for up to the, to the developer. I don't know that they have decided which product they're going to build on these lots. Okay. So I'm, I'm not aware of the price point. Um, square footage? Okay. I'm sorry. It's okay. We're, not, we're not to the point yet where we've decided what product is going on the lots. Okay. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> All righty. Any other comments or questions? Just to clarify, um, Elsmer Austin. Quickly, so you, you know, you noted that Penny is an engineer. Is she an employee of Glenwood Homes? Is she a what? Is she an employee of Glenwood Homes? No, sir. So she, it's a different firm. Yes, it's a different. Penny, firm. Penny Engineering is a firm that has a contract. Linwood, Lin Home. What is Linwood it? Homes? Right. Has a contract with Penny Engineering to to do this design work. Is that yes, right? Yes, sir. That's correct. She's just there's a. So the penny that's on the Glenwood Homes materials is a different penny. Excuse me? I'm just trying to clarify if the penny that's listed as an employee within Glenwood Homes is a different penny. I mean, this isn't a huge issue. I just wanted to clarify if she was. Not, not that I know of. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm sorry. I don't have the answer to that. Okay. Thanks. Questions or comments? Uh, Councilmember Kamen? I have specific traffic-related questions. Um, just recognizing that a few of the residents mentioned the curves that are in this section of um, Clayton. And I'm guessing if there were to have that um, stub out, the three stub outs and the traffic coming out of all of it, is that assessed at a different level when there's a school nearby? Um, so, yeah, we are, I guess, looking at this area as well as uh, Chandler and Freeman Road as part of our um, Vision Zero program. Uh, these are old sort of county roads that um, yeah, have a lot of curvature and uh, not very 
forgiving shoulders. So I think the city actually does have a sidewalk project closer to the school right at the corner of Clayton and Freeman to, to try to make some improvements there as well. But um, yeah, so generally that's sort of how we're handling it. Could, and I'm not sure <clears throat> who um, would answer the question, but I'm trying to get some kind of confidence in addressing specifically what you mentioned around the Vision Zero um, at a rate that doesn't increase the amount of accidents in this area based on any additional cars or any additional like developments being built in this in that section. Um, I'm trying to uh, think of So based on based on um, your vision zero approach, financially for the city, how much of a burden would this create to create an annexation of this section? That's the question. Um, it doesn't really have any impact in that. Um, I mean, these are existing conditions. We have existing um, city subdivisions in the area. So I mean, whether this is approved and annexed or not, we're still going to have those same concerns. In, the, in that area that, that have to be addressed one way or another. And does the timeline move up with an additional development or does it stay the same? Uh, generally would stay about the same. I mean, uh, particularly given the size of the development, the more development, the more the traffic and the more pressure it puts on an area, particularly safety and potential. Um, but uh, this is relatively small, so I doubt it would have that significant of an impact. So I'm, wrest I'm wrestling with the fact that this it's not specifically this development, but it's the development in that area that's created this burden, and how we address it is my concern in annexing this section. Does that make sense? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, no, it does. I mean, anywhere we have these old two-lane sort of county roads, whether at, I mean, Dearborn, Cheek, um, I mean, we have them, unfortunately, in far too many areas. But um, the more development, the more traffic, lack of sidewalks, the more pressure it puts on those areas for, for improvements. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Are there other questions at this moment? Council Mayor Milton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Levan, just um, I think one, maybe one and a half other questions. The, is it, is it, sorry, is it a fair assertion um, that Glenwood Homes at some point does plan to develop this property. That it does at one point. Does plan to develop. Right. At some point. Either way, regardless. Right. Um, what, one, of, uh, and the, one of our commissioners who was already alluded to, Mr. Miller, um, said, uh, made a comment that should a developer decide to memorialize their assurances to the neighborhood in the development plan, the council might delay its decision to allow time for that. <clears throat> Would that be particularly injurious to you? Would, would, would you, no. would, if we were to delay this in, in light of the concerns of the uh, um, neighborhood and also in light of the fact that you, you're going to ultimately develop, right. uh, this, would it be particularly injurious to you if we, if we delay this? I, I don't believe so. I, I don't want to speak too, too much to, the, the, to Penny. Unfortunately, she had a long planned uh, obligation to be out of town for this, so that's why I'm here in the first place. But I, I don't think that it, it would be much of an issue, no. Thank you. Mr. Levant, Mr. Levan, I, I want to make sure you understand what Councilmember Middleton is saying. He's saying not just that you would delay, but that you would delay and produce a development plan for this property. And you're saying you don't think it would be much of an issue. I may be wrong. It may be an issue. It may not be an issue. I, I don't want to give a yes on that. All right. I will suggest, council members, that we hold this public hearing open. Uh, Mr. Attorney, is that good? Um, and uh, that we, uh, uh, would it be best to set a date certain? And so uh, why don't we set a date certain? Uh, what would be, uh, maybe, let me ask Mr. Young, maybe you can help me out. Uh, what would be, if, we're, if they are to produce a development plan, this takes time. Uh. Right, so Mr. Mayor, again, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Um, if, if the applicant chooses to produce a development plan, we, we would ask that the item be referred back to the administration rather than continued because um, the time it takes to produce that plan and to review that plan is 
is uncertain. Yeah. Now, what could be done is that a, a date certain be identified for a continuance, and then at that time we could ask for it to be referred back to the applicant. Application has uh, the applicant has decided not to submit a development plan or has submitted a development plan and and has an indeterminate time for it to be set, uh, or it could be um, referred back now. I, again, I, I would ask that that be done at the applicant's representation about whether they intend to submit a development plan or not. I understand. And Mr. Mayor, if I might clarify, I thank you for your, your clarification. The, the spirit of my question was not to for us to impose a timetable on you. My assumption is that the development plan is an inevitability if you're going to develop the land uh, at some point. You know when you're, what, well, you're not you person, but your, your outfit knows when that's going to happen or not going to happen. And my question was, at that point when you make that decision, uh, and bring that development plan when it's financially feasible, it fits into your timeline, would there be any injury in, in the interim if we did not um, um, approve this rezoning? I think you answered it, um, but I appreciate the uh, clarification. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Manager. Mr. Young, could you clarify, we're interchanging a lot of words here between site plan and development plan, and I don't think that necessarily, if I understood correctly, a development plan is going to come under any every scenario or uh, just right so so just to reiterate uh, mr. manager so a, a development plan is voluntary on behalf of the applicant it does have a lot of the details that have been discussed here tonight like it can identify the exact location of access points it can identify the maximum number of units it can identify the type of units things like buffering wetlands to be preserved or stream buffers um, but it is not required it's voluntary on the part of the applicant all of that information would be required to be submitted at what's called a site plan, which is later in the process prior to a building permit being approved. And that's done pursuant to the approval of whatever zoning designation council chooses to put on the property. And, and is the cost associated with both of those similar and duplicative, or could you give some comment about that? Yeah, yes, it, it is, uh, there's a lot of overlap in the content of a development plan and a site plan. So if you do a development plan, the cost of site plan is somewhat less because a lot of that site work has been done, but it's um, still, there's still additional cost. So. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. So the, um, let me just try again on the, some questions on the transportation, Mr. Judge. The, um, my, my understanding what I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, the the ability of the applicant to put a a um, an entrance out onto directly onto Clayton Road is quite unlikely under whether or not there's a development plan because of the DOT uh, prescription proscription. Well, correct. I mean, if there were a development plan, NCDOT typically reviews those, so we would most likely have that determination resolved as to whether or not they were going to permit an access point, whereas without the development plan, they have not been involved in the process to this point. Right. So um, in, in all scenarios, it seems what is most likely is that it would be the, the traffic would flow through the roads that would be connected to these stub outs. Is that correct? Yes. And so if there was a development plan, how would that change what happens at the stub outs? What would be, what would be different if there was a development plan? How would that change what happened with these stub outs? Um, it's unlikely there would be anything different, and like I said, unless they were to identify some sort of environmental feature where they weren't able to directly connect the streets at those stub outs. So depending on where it was, you might end up with just putting a cul-de-sac bulb or something off the end of one of the stub outs rather than connecting a, a street all the way through um, or some sort of T-type turnaround. But if there was a, if there was a cul-de-sac put at the end of one of the stub outs, this would force more traffic through the other road that was other two roads for which there was not a cul-de-sac? Most likely, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, I have some thoughts to offer, but wait, yeah. Um, isn't it also true that while the development plan probably <clears throat> wouldn't change the required 
connectors here because of what we know about um, what DOT is likely to do on the other potential exit. The reason that a development plan is advisable in this situation isn't because it would change the need for the step up, but it would tell us with certainty the number of units that are on this development property. And that that's the reason that the neighbors are here tonight. is isn't because they oppose development on the property, although they would certainly prefer that, I'm sure. It's that without a development plan, there is no way for the developer to make any commitment, despite their representations to us tonight, about the number of units that will be on the property. Mm -hmm. like that's the, it's not that the stub outs would change, it's that we don't know, aside from a sketch that was drawn up you know, earlier this year uh, that shows 23 lots, we don't have any way to, to enforce that or hold the developer accountable. And that's why the folks are here. I think that's why the development plan is important. Thank you. All right. Um, I think it's also, I mean, it's also um, important to note that the, the way in which this process works, <clears throat> there's a lot more, um, how do you say, it? like, I mean, I just can't help but think if this were Jordan High School, there'd be a difference of um, appeal in this conversation. And so it's just kind of um, unsettling to even consider it, recognizing that there's been so much development in this area already and the traffic concerns have not been addressed. I'm, I mean, I'm very hesitant, and so that's why I put out, like I put forward that, that question around recognizing that we're behind the gun on this. We're pushing ourselves even further. Thanks. Could you speak to the level of service questions on the roads in question, Mr. Judge? Yes, so the adjacent roadways uh, are operating, as I said, below uh, level of service D currently uh, from a 24-hour peak hour, but anywhere where you have a, a school of the size of Southern High School, there, there very likely are some potential 30-minute uh, windows around uh, operating of the school that, that cause some congestion in the area. Can you speak to the safety, the pedestrian safety in that area as well? So... Well, there's, yeah, I mean, there's limited sidewalks or not a very well-connected sidewalk network in the area. So the areas that have developed or have been annexed have provided sidewalk where the areas that are not. So there, there are sidewalk gaps in the area. All right. Other comments? Mr. Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem. I um, would support leaving the public hearing open and setting a future date at which the applicant could be present to answer some more questions. Um, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to approving uh, this rezoning without a development plan. It's small, it's low density, and I don't think, I, I think the problems that we've heard from the neighbors and that we um, have heard from our staff that exists in the area will exist regardless of whether we add 20 more units of housing um, to the area. So I think dealing with those is kind of a separate question, but I do feel like we've had some questions about this proposal that are, um, that the applicant might be able to more effectively answer and would like to hear from her directly at a future date. Thank you. Thanks. Any other comments? Mr. Mayor. All right. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, under normal circumstances, I might uh, be willing to support a uh, delay in our ultimate consideration of the merits of this proposal. However, um, this must feel like deja vu to the folks uh, who live near this property. Um, the original Planning Commission hearing in this matter was in June. It was delayed uh, for two months for this very reason, mm -hmm. because there was no development plan and no way for the developer to commit to what's on their sketch. They had two months in which the Planning Commission told this developer, the engineer, the applicant, sorry, the applicant, go and work with the neighbors and come back with a development plan that allows you to commit to them the things that you've said. They came back in August. The developer had refused to do that. That's why one of the reasons the Planning Commission voted 2 to 11 to reject this proposed rezoning. It comes to us today. Now, three months later, four months later, since August, these questions are not new. 
These issues are not springing out of whole cloth today. These are well known. The developer could have at any time put in a development plan that would answer these questions, despite the fact that she had a longstanding commitment and couldn't be here. The, the development plan could have answered those questions for us, but instead, we're here. Um, and I don't think it's fair to ask these folks to come back a fourth time to City Hall to give the same comments, to pose these same objections. And um, you know, the applicant understood the situation back in August um, and knew what they were gonna do. Uh, and I think that, you know, I, I would oppose leaving it open and I think we should decide the merits tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. All right, I'll, uh, I'll just make a couple of comments. I just want to say to the neighbors, first of all, thank you all for being here. We appreciate it and understand your concerns. Um, the, the way I'm hearing this, and I'll just interpret it, I'll give you my interpretation, my colleagues may differ. Uh, I don't think that the, um, the difference in, uh, it, that, that there's going to be, there's not much difference in traffic that's gonna occur on these roads in any significant way, except there will be some small additional traffic at that bad rush hour that you all are accustomed to when, when, when Southern High School's in session in it, <clears throat> in the morning and after. I don't think other than that, that, that the, as I read and as I listen to Mr. Mr. Judge and as I read this, that uh, there'll be other significant traffic impacts, uh, whether or not this is developed at uh, 23 lots or 34. So I don't, I'm, I'm not um, persuaded by that, that that is an important concern here because I don't think anything is really, I, I think that even if it developed at this, at the, the buy right uh, ability is, uh, I believe 16 lots, is that correct? So the developer can now come in and build 16 lots by right. They can just do that. And so the question is, it's seven more or 16 more, uh, will there be a significant difference in traffic that you all were noticed uh, that would be something that would justify us denying the developer the right to, uh, or the ability uh, to add more density on this land? Um, I do think that the R10 designation is actually a better designation. Most of the planning commissioners agreed. Uh, I, don't, I didn't see much uh, difference of opinion on that. I think that the, it does come down to, uh, I would agree with uh, Council Member Reese, it seems to me that the one thing that development plan might be able to do that would be important is to provide assurance on the number of lots. I don't see any other significant ability it would give. I know that at least one of the planning commissioners argued that it would give some more assurances on the traffic that would matter a lot. That seems unlikely to me, uh, but I agree uh, council member that it would give more assurance on the on the number of lots and so I think that's the that's the question we're deciding do we want to hold this item uh, open uh, and ask the developer to uh, I think that maybe you were asking uh, mayor pro tem that the developer come back and give us some other kinds of assurances on the number of lots um, besides what is available in the development plan um, you know, those, those, those assurances would not be legally binding, but they could maybe give us some more comfort. Um, so we have a couple of options in front of us. I actually believe it's my call on whether or not the whole of the public hearing open or not, but I'm, I'm interested in any thoughts that you all may have. I, I'm, I mean, we can vote tonight um, or, or we can hold the uh, public hearing open and we can uh, and try to get some more information from the applicant. Um, at a, at, a, at a time certain in the future, you know, a month from now, if it's not going to be a development plan, right? Is that right, Mr. Young? Mr. Berry, I think. Yes, <clears throat> I think. Uh, just that's, that's correct, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Pat Young again with the planning department. If the applicant decides to submit a development plan, we would ask that the, this item go back to the yeah. planning commission. Sure. So again, if it's continued, it would be with the presumption that there would be no development plan, just additional information from the applicant um, available. Two cycles, okay. Uh, Council Member Caballero. I just wanted to say um, that if we do vote tonight, my vote will be no. If our standard is going to be that developers really work with neighborhoods, which we just saw very, very um, 
robust process, then that is the commitment level that I expect from developers. There's been plenty of time to do a development review. I appreciate you all coming out. Uh, I think this is exactly my, this is what I was speaking to earlier. There was a community here with, um, in, a, in a part of town that is more affluent, that has more means, and they were treated very differently than this community has. So uh, if we vote tonight, my vote will be no. I would encourage the applicant to come back so that we could ask questions if that's the way we decide to go. Mr. Manger, if I, and I, I just wanna make sure that I um, reiterate that beyond the traffic concern, what I'm hearing is a concern about safety. And so it's not just the cars, it is the pedestrians, it is the students who walk those streets to catch the bus and not just the school bus, but the public bus, and recognizing exactly what um, Councilmember Caballero mentioned. We've been having this conversation um, at length for communities that do not look like this community um, sitting in the audience right now. And I think it's just appalling that the developer is not even here to have this conversation. And as Councilmember Reese pointed out, it's also kind of just disappointing that this process has gone on for as long as it has. So this is why I would also be opposed to holding it open. I think that we should vote and, I mean, just recognize that this is not what, what's best for the city at this point. Ms. Mr. Mayor, is, mm -hmm. a, is a question to the developer still in order since you've closed? Yeah, absolutely, go ahead, I haven't Thank closed. You. Mr. LeVan, um, you've heard a TikTok about, in this process uh, concerning the planning commission that it was, matter was carried over and then revisit it again. And, and if, you can, if you can't speak to this, forgive me. In the interim between the first time this was heard by the Planning Commission and coming back, is it your understanding that you guys were supposed to be working on a, a uh, development plan in that interim period? Do you, no, do you know? I, I think the main issue with the, the developing the development plan for the developer was that they did not want to get that process started and commit to something without knowing what the zoning was going to be. So I, I, I fully agree with the commissioners that want to vote tonight. I don't think anything's gonna change to roll this over for another month and put the neighbors through another meeting. Um, I think that as the, I don't remember who said it, but someone mentioned that the development plan is voluntary. So I would request that the city council see that if that's the main issue that I don't think it's, it's very fair if a voluntary development plan be the deciding factor between RS-10 and RS-20. All right, thank you, Mr. LeVan. Well, that's pretty clear. I'm gonna declare this public hearing closed and the matter is now in front of the council. Um, the, we would, to approve this development, we would need. Uh, Mr. May, I just wanna make sure that I address the comment that was made about the deciding factor being a development plan. That would not be the case. It would actually be the, on the basis of what's best for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? We have a motion. We, we, we could, uh, I would accept an, a motion to adopt the ordinance annexing the Carrington Woods development in the city of Durham, effective December 31st. Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry, I do have one question. Mm -hmm. The annexation and the rezoning, are those separate items that we're going to be voting on? Is the, is the annexation dependent on the rezoning? The, they are separate items that you would be voting on. The annexation is not dependent upon the zoning. However, the zoning is dependent upon the annexation. Got it. So if we were to annex the property, if we were not, if we didn't annex the property, can the developer still develop it RS-20? They could develop it as RS-20, correct. Okay, they do already have access to the city, like city utilities that would allow them no, to do that or no? no? Under the current, Zoning. That, so the, the current zoning that's on this property is county zoning, mm -hmm. even though it has, because we have a merged ordinance and a merged department, it's the same designation, mm -hmm. but that RS-20 city designation would have to be applied at a later date. So hypothetically, you could annex it and then subsequently within, I think it's 30 days, I'd have to check the statute, apply RS-20 or some other zoning designation. Okay, so if they but, were to But we couldn't it. just tran directly translate without you, you all's action. Okay, so they would, if they were to develop it now, RS-20 with county zoning, it would be like wells and septic systems? That's correct, and, and it's very unlikely at that size that they'd be able to accommodate well and septic tanks. They'd probably have to be much closer to an acre. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good questions. All righty. Um, 
Is there a motion to adopt the ordinance annexing the Carrington Woods development to the city of Durham? So moved. Second. Second. All righty. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? The motion fails 4 3 with council members right. Littleton, Caballero, Freeman, and Reese voting no. Thank you very much. Mr. Attorney, what, do we not, should we be voting on the other two after this fails? None of the subsequent items are required with the failure of the annexation. I want to thank the neighbors for coming very much and also want to thank the applicant. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to item 24, Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment for Omnibus Changes 12. Thank you very much, Michael Stock with the Planning Department and uh, uh, knowing the mayor's joy of omnibus text amendments a little mm -hmm. uh, delayed Hanukkah. I, I call this this period uh, every year taking stock. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. A little delayed Hanukkah gift for you. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> belated Hanukkah gift. Uh -huh. um, TC 18002 is a text amendment for technical revisions and minor policy changes to various provisions of the Unified Development Ordinance, or UDO. The amendments are identified as necessary corrections, clarifications, reorganization, or other minor changes to clarify the intent of the regulations or codify interpretations of regulations or reflect minor policy changes that are not solely technical in nature. Uh, the details uh, regarding these amendments are found within your staff memo and in your agenda packet. Uh, the JCCPC uh, was presented with a draft uh, for review and comment on August 1st, 2018, and no substantial changes or modifications beyond any technical corrections were requested. Uh, <coughs> the Planning Commission recommended approval 9 to 0 at their October 9th meeting uh, with referral of the neighborhood protection overlay process revisions that were originally part of this uh, to be referred back to staff. So there, then any neighborhood protection overlay uh, process amendments are not, not part of this. Thank you. Uh, as a reminder, uh, City Council will be required to take two actions. The first would be an action on the appropriate statement of consistency. Uh, that's found as attachment A. Uh, the second would be an action on the ordinance amendment itself, attachment B. And there's one adjustment to that ordinance uh, uh, staff would like to make. Uh, the effective date of that ordinance, uh, staff would like that to be revised to January 15th, 2019 to coincide with Board of uh, Commissioners action that will happen uh, later next year due to their missed meeting on December 10th. So it's to, co to coordinate both actions. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. You answered my question about the NPO. Is there any other, are there any other questions? That you've heard the staff report. I'm going to declare this public hearing open. Are there any questions for staff? If not, uh, is there anyone that would like to speak on this item? I see Mr. Bill Ripley is here. Mr. Ripley, are you a proponent or an opponent of this? Uh... <laughs> uh, a clarification, and, and so let me introduce myself. Uh, Bill Ripley, 5011 South Park Drive. Mayor, fellow council members, appreciate your time. Um, I've reviewed the, the changes in the ordinance, and for the most part, I, I don't have complaints, but I do have some suggestions. Um, I know that uh, Mike and some other folks are working on expanding housing choices, and um, there were some things I think the council and others are in favor of to, as the uh, overview states, to uh, often, over time, zoning rules have restricted development in many neighborhoods almost exclusively to single-family dwellings, eliminating many of the small-scale and often more affordable multifamily options that once existed. Often referred to as missing middle housing, this project will explore ways to eliminate regulatory barriers and expand the choices that people have when it comes to housing types. Well, part of that same goal is anytime there's changes or to the ordinance that are more restrictive or uh, compound development efforts, it increases the cost of housing. Um, and I've I mostly do small development residential, and a couple things in this proposed change. The one I'm most concerned about is CBUs, but I will get to that. I will mention two more. I uh, don't know that it, it matters much, but I was curious as to why we, we have a townhouse development ordinance, but we're restricting we can only have 25% of two-unit buildings. We can have six unit buildings, eight unit buildings, four unit buildings, but we're restricting to 25% of the total buildings to be two units. 
I don't know that that's it's a restriction, but I don't know if it's any good for the city of Durham or there's any uh, rational planning reason for that. Second, um, we have to deal with links and nodes on our uh, new streets, new neighborhoods, cul-de-sacs, connection points. And in doing such, uh, the threshold we have to meet is sometimes hard to do because we can't find enough connections and people want cul-de-sacs, which are somewhat uh, prohibited by links and nodes. And so the uh, ordinance on page 18 here changes the degree of a road curvature from 75 degrees to 120 degrees, which means we don't get credit for a node on a 75 degrees anymore. So it's more difficult to, uh, in some small infill neighborhoods, to meet that criteria. But most importantly is the CBUs. And the mailboxes are required by the post office, and we will install those. Most developers have been installing them for a couple years now. The boxes themselves are not an issue. Uh, as I mentioned to staff several months ago, though, if you have, according to this chart, excuse me, I didn't know there was, did I have I'm going to give Mr. Ripley another uh, minute. I'm sorry, I didn't know there was a clock here. Okay, I should have um, told you my apologies. Page 26, uh, 5.4C1, the restrictions in the table of parking places for a CBUs is a two houses, we have to have two additional parking places. So if we build a two house community, we have to build a parking space and, an and a second handicap accessible. That's overburdensome for two, but nobody's building two, but even 10 or 20, we shouldn't have to build parking spaces dedicated just for a single street or a small neighborhood. Uh, Cary and Apex have rules that accept uh, units of 15 or 20 houses, but they do not require parking. Um, so I would suggest that it be worded such that we can have up to 20 CBUs or 25 CBUs before parking is required. Um, if you've got 10 houses on each side of the street and nobody has to walk 350, 400 feet, that's my suggestion. Thank you. Mr. Ripley, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask staff, uh, Mr. Stock, if you could uh, respond to uh, the, were you able to follow Mr. Ripley's concerns? One, as I understood, is the restrictions on the two unit buildings. One has to do with the road curvature uh, and, and credit for links and nodes there. And the third had to do with the CBUs and the parking requirements related to those. So those, those were the three that I heard. Did I get that right, Mr. Ripley? So for townhouses right now, um, you don't, you're not allowed any two unit townhouse development. So it was requested through um, other developers to add some flexibility to that requirement and it started at 20% and uh, there was a request to up it to 25% through the planning commission meeting which we felt was reasonable. Through expanding housing choices, we're looking to expand that even further. Uh, to create more flexibility with townhouse unit design. So what you're getting right now is more than what is actually on the books now. Uh, the links and node uh, methodology, it's actually clarifying the methodology for a curvature in a road. Right now it's a 75 degree kind of bend and it, the details of it are such that um, we found that actually uh, through discussions with our development review team that uh, developers tend to game the system in terms of where that 75 degree bend really is uh, in a road. The number that is proposed is actually already in the ordinance and was used in a different definition within the ordinance and it was a much clearer uh, uh, measurement methodology to use uh, achieving the same thing. And the third with the CBUs, uh, USPS requires uh, uh, parking access, uh, uh, accessible parking, and we developed these numbers based upon other ordinances that we found throughout North Carolina and um, other jurisdictions actually throughout the, the nation. Um, the parking numbers that are in there can be achieved. Um, you don't even have to meet them if you're already providing parking, if, you're, if it's more of a group parking, part of a clubhouse and such like that, if you're placing the uh, units there, but there would be some minimal parking requirements if you're spreading out the units uh, throughout a single family subdivision. Pat Young, again with the Planning Department, just quickly add to Mr. Stock's comment on the CBUs. 
Um, it's our understanding that there's no minimum size of subdivision that's that are exempted from the CBUs by the U.S. Postal Service. If if indeed the Postal Service will allow smaller subdivisions, like Mr. Roque will be describing, three units, six units, to be exempted from that requirement, we would certainly be more than willing to look at modifying these provisions going forward um, to to allow for that exemption. We're not aware that one exists based on our consultation with the Postal Service. So that's why you see it like it is, as Mr. Stock just said. Could you explain that again? Sure. So the reason we're requiring the parking for the CBUs is that the U.S. Postal Service appears to require the CBUs, these common um, boxes, for all new single-family developments, even very small ones. So what I was what I was trying to get at was that if the Postal Service will allow an exemption from the requ requiring the CBUs. Um, or requiring parking for the CBU is we would want to incorporate and reflect that. But we, we don't believe that there is an exemption for even the small subdivisions. I think we agree fundamentally with Mr. Ripley that we don't want to impose costs on small subdivisions because that does reflect in the, the price of housing. But we are just trying to come into adherence to the U.S. Postal Service requirements. I see. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, any other comments, Mr. Stock? That's all I have. Council members, questions or comments? Just a question regarding, uh, there was a comment in the planning commissioner's notes around something around uh, neighborhood-led organizing would be prevented. I'm struggling to understand how that happens. I don't know. So with the MPO process, I'm sorry, so we're moving to a different section. There was some restrictions put in place since the MPO process revisions were removed from this. Okay. So moment. that'll come to you at a later date. All right. All right. Any other questions or comments, council members? All righty. If not, uh, anyone else would like to speak on the, um, Mr. Ripley? Go ahead. Thank you. Just for clarification, uh, San Matthews, who's the growth management for the Durham U.S. Postal Service, says they're is no exemption, as staff said, but they probably would look at a two to four lot exemption. However, there is no parking requirement required by the U.S. Postal Service. So Durham is asking for required parking. Cary and Apex have an exemption for 15 or 20 houses or less not requiring parking. We do have to do CBUs, but parking is a new thing that's coming up on this Durham changed ordinance, but not required by the Postal Service. If there is parking, they're correct, and it does have to be accessible. I agree with that, but there's no parking required. Thank you. Mr. Stein? Our understanding is that there's required accessible parking at CBU locations. Mr. Young? Just to clarify, we're, we're pretty far in the weeds here, but the U.S. Postal Service does not require um, the parking. The, it's the accessibility code of the state building code through our inspections department has said that because this is a location that needs to be accessible, that we need to have parking and that parking needs to be handicap accessible. We certainly, as I tried to allude to earlier, will explore our ability under the accessibility code to grant or modify exemptions for small subdivisions and, and bring that back to you in the future. Thank you very much. Yeah. All righty. Um, thank you very much. Anyone else like to speak on this item? If not, I'm going to declare, declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. I will need two motions, one to adopt the consistency statement, two to adopt the ordinance. Uh, and uh, I'll just say before we have the motions, Mr. Ripley, I appreciate your coming and I appreciate your raising these things. We are also, uh, and I was glad that staff talked about coming back to us with the expanding housing choices uh, where we would be able to be looking at an expansion of the, uh, a, a uh, less restrictions on the, uh, on the number of the townhouses. And uh, so we'll look forward to get that. We'll be getting that this spring. <coughs> I did want to just say that to you, so thank you. All right, uh, council members, do I hear a motion to adopt the appropriate consistency statement? So moved. Second. Uh, Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. 
Motion passes 7-0. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt the ordinance? And if I may, Mr. Mayor, just with the adoption of the ordinance, a reminder to the adoption of the ordinance with an effective date of January 15th, 2019. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, to adopt the ordinance with, the, with, with an effective date of January 15th, 2019. So moved. Second. Second. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to item 25, the Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment for Private Streets. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Again, Michael Sock with the Planning Department. A text Amendment TC 18-0006 is a privately initiated request by Mitch Craig of CE Group Inc. to amend paragraph 12.2.2, other forms of access to allow an additional instance where private streets would be allowed. Uh, this uh, application would apply primarily only within the county jurisdiction. Uh, additionally, uh, and the reason why Council is hearing it tonight is that the existing uh, parts of it with existing text is revised to more explicitly require private streets to meet or exceed public street standards and add specific certification criteria. Uh, the original request uh, applied the allowance more broadly and uh, subsequent to the Planning Commission public hearing, the applicant revised the request uh, which substantially limits its application and addresses many of the concerns raised by the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission at that time did recommend denial 5-7 to seven of the text amendment at September 11th. Board Commissioners have already heard this item and approved it at its November 13th meeting. Um, as a reminder, City Council will be required to take two actions. The first would be an action on the appropriate consistency statement found on attachment B, and the second would be an action on the ordinance itself, attachment C. Um, just to clarify what I just said, um, the meat of the ordinance that you're looking at tonight is pretty much a county-only jurisdictional issue. Uh, the reason why you're hearing it tonight is the introductory paragraph in that section uh, revises and clarifies uh, how private roads are approved, and that can happen within the city or the county, and that's why you're hearing it tonight. So it's a technical change on that part. Thank you very much, Mr. Stock. Uh, um, you've heard the report from staff. I'm going to declare this public hearing open. <clears throat> is there anyone that would like to be heard on this item? Hearing none, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed. Uh, any, any comments or questions from council members? And if not, I'll accept the motion to adopt the consistency statement. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we, that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thanks. A motion to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second that we adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. Um, Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 6-1 with Council Member Freeman voting no. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that there is no more business to come before this body, and I'm going to declare this meeting adjourned at 9.50. Thank you all. I need to correct the first one. It should actually be a no. For some reason, it didn't capture it. Okay. On the vote, on the consistency statement vote yes. on that last item? Both. I, both. But on, on item 25? Yes. Yeah. So, Council Member Freeman, thank you, Madam Clerk.